neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Love not the world, they compromise daily. Just repent, confess, believe. This world's so crazy. Yeah, love not the world. To the trump of Yah sounds. Keep on seeking for Messiah. One day he's coming down. Yeah, love not the world. They compromise daily. Just repent, confess, believe. This world's so crazy. Yeah, love not the world. To the trump of Yah sounds. Keep on seeking for Messiah. One day he's coming down. Yeah. Like Nas, they hate me now, cause I ain't blazing and pulling up. But it's hard to fail when you growing up in that holy rule. We keep showing up, and so don't be getting mad at me, cause I'm a change man with a game plan. Used to chase bands with snake hands, now washed clean by the slain lamb. Look, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of this life will do you. But greater is he that is living inside of you. I got no reason to lie to you, cause I could have died in my sins and never could win until I decided to repent and confess and believe in his Lord. Redeem me like I was the prodigal. The love of the Father can nothing compare to with never when he's the epitome i keep his commandments he came and delivered me free from all that was killing me can never repay what he's given me i just walk in faith and step with a new mind just had a repentant in due time it's finished work my new grind tears fall when i think of all my loved ones that don't know christ never cared to even hear the gospel that so many give their own lives most of the time can't sleep nights trying to calculate what a steep price he paid for us so i see it like he died once so we could live twice i was thinking i was cool right till satan tried to get the noose tight y'all cut the rope and i got loose to fight but then Dark flare cause it was too bright Now I can see I got new sight Torah keeper, that's new light I put on Christ so I do right I got born again, that's new life So love not the world They compromise daily Just repent, confess, believe This world's so crazy Yeah, love not the world To the trump of y'all sounds Keep on seeking for Messiah One day he's coming down Yeah, love not the world They compromise daily Just repent, confess, believe This world's so crazy Yeah, love not the world To the trump of y'all sounds Keep on seeking for Messiah One day he's coming down Yeah, yeah. Love not the world This place is going down They gon' waste my pearls And I'd rather put them in my crown Yeah, All the boys turn girls And everything is upside down Ain't nobody really cared to repent or prepare for the end He gon' cut life down I'm in the middle of a battlefield Got the armor wrong cause that battle's real And I trust God he got a cattle field And that Bible is my battle still Fight the good, fight the devil Coming for the church now If you can't fight the spirit your battle, you better learn how Hit your knees and pray You don't wanna see the lake Better stand and fight Cause we all wanna see you on that day Better turn your back on friends Better turn your back on sin Better turn your back on everything That goes against him Repent and know the truth He's listening to you You should let him in You know what he did for you They cracked the whip That cat and nine tails And rip your flesh out Leave this world behind, cause everything you see is hellbound. Yeah, yeah. yeah love not yeah, the world, not the world. They compromise daily. Yeah. Just repent, confess, believe. Uh -huh. This world's so crazy. Yeah, yeah. love not yeah. the world. Uh -huh. To the trump of Yah sounds. Yeah. Keep on seeking yeah. for Messiah. Yeah, sure. One day he's coming down. Yeah, yeah. love not yeah. the world. Not the world. They compromise daily. Yeah. Just repent, confess, believe. Uh -huh. This world's so crazy. Yeah, yeah. love not yeah. the world. Uh, to the trump of y'all sounds yeah. Keep on seeking for Messiah okay. One day he's coming down yeah. yeah. To the world I got no love Man it broke me down like that Yola Straight toe up from the flow up And I praise his name that he showed up And he showed that that's no doubt He pulled me out of that old rat He give me living water that's no drought Me living from my eye but that's sold out yeah. The ways of the flesh it is sick And it truly I'm sick of them We gotta repent of them We heavenly citizens can't live with sinner And entering it in the carcinogens So enter the rendering by the surrender Remember the Reuben delivering we we hinder a genus when y'all change the enemy The kingdom within the beginning Man, the world's getting strange They've been deranged The wave been estranged That's real, dude They push fear porn Coerce to conform And verge to the norm That's a real feud And I've been fueled by that root When he stand true It ensue But if he is forced Then who could ever Really ever be against you? Yeah, the time been at hand We know when the plan The wickedness has been increased They poison our food They poison our minds It's clear they want us all to cease But when you repent Confess and belief You got lamb's blood Up on your fleece You a masterpiece That won't cease And bet the masses peace It won't decrease 
Yeah, it's a spiritual war that we fight in the past few years that has heightened. They pushing the woke and enlightened. Attention with nations ignite. We got his right hand, don't be frightened. Yeah. Satan's a sucker, damn right. We ain't backing down. Yeah, we said a car, we pack around. Yeah. Stand for Christ, we gon' cast the crown. Man, it's rim the beers on a crack of nine. Yeah. I, I was just getting ready to say, yo, that's cold. And then I was gonna say, yo, that's fire. I don't know which one it is, but it's dope.
Salvation's drawing near He's coming to claim his own He's coming to take us home Hello and welcome to Honor of Kings Season 4. Kim, we're back. Yeah, it's been a uh, a little while, but you know, guys, sometimes, uh, you know, we like to save the best for last, I guess you could say, even though we're starting this season technically. We figured we would bring more people on to this uh, show, other brothers and maybe sisters in the future who uh, have the same passion for God's Word and um, books that maybe they're not familiar with, uh, we just figured we would invite them on and bring them into this discussion that Sean and I have had for the last few seasons. Yep. We are going to continue to look at books that were either not included or were included in other canons around the world. We're going to test them to their historical and theological merits. And we figured why not uh, make it a council? <laughs> why not make it actually a, a group activity? Let Because we don't really give a lot of validity to the, the man-made councils of the past that did this in different Christian communities. So nothing's stopping us from doing it today. Yeah, so exactly. I thought it'd be a great idea. Let's let's put together a group of people and let's all look at it together. Yes, and that's what we've been doing for uh, the last few years. And it's definitely been fun. We've covered books like First Enoch, Jubilees, Second Baruch, Tobit, um, the books of Adam and Eve, the Testament of Solomon, various books that uh, have made it in and out of canons throughout history and or were just never in canons to begin with. And we just decided, I think, how many years ago is this, Sean? You know, five or six years ago, we just decided, why don't we just start a show where gentlemen like us go on screen, talk about these books, talk about the historicity of the books, talk about the content of the books and, you know, come to conclusion as to why they were removed. Maybe we agree with the the, um, the former councils of old and why they had removed them, or maybe we disagree. And a lot of times, for those of you who are familiar with the show, we've disagreed as to why they were removed or not included. And so this is kind of the, the heart of this show. We just want to present things on screen, have exchanges, and hopefully you yourselves who are viewing this also uh, will read the books and study them yourselves and, and see what you think about them as well. Because Sean and I, let, let's let's be real. We love the word of God. We have a passion for, for truth. But we weren't given a heavenly authority. It's not like you know these heavenly rays came down upon us and said, start a council. Just like it didn't happen in times of past. So we just 21st century folks decided let's let's do what they did in those days of old and see why why we can't do it. That's right. You know, Ken, if we did, if we were if we were having this this fun little jab at having a council, what would we call this a council like this? 
Well, ideally, I think our council would exhibit the fruits of the spirit. So we're thinking it'd be funny to kind of like a play of words of the Council of Nicaea, call it the Council of Nice to see you. Oh, that's awesome. Well, how fitting. And <laughs> Josh Keith from Fountain Earth Brothers. Yeah. It's nice to see you, brother. Yeah, nice to see you. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I, I can't get that out of my head. The creeds of nice to see you. Yeah, because we spend so <laughs> oh. much time going against those creeds. Cal B from Anchor to Truth. Nice to Shalom, see you. Shalom. Nice to see you. Shalom, Kyle. Jonathan from Anchor to Truth. Nice to hey, see everybody. you. <laughs> Guys, we, we may have a few more joining later, depending on their schedule, but um, we wanted to go ahead and get started. Guys, we... Um, we are just so grateful that you guys want to be a part of this. Take a look at these books with us. Now, I know that, um, Josh, you've already, on your channel, you've already been delving into some of these books that were mm -hmm. not in the American canon or were removed from the American canon. So you're no stranger to this process. Mm -hmm. Same thing for Jonathan and Kyle with their co-host as well, Joe, on Anchor to Truth. Uh, they've been studying some of the apocryphal books as well, or I should say some of the left out books because <laughs> you know they're not apocryphal to, to some Christian communities around the world. They're completely canonized and inspired. Mm -hmm. And so that this just brings up this conversation, you know, it's like mutually shared interest in, wait a minute, who decided the Bible was only this amount of books and how did they go through that decision process? Uh, what was that like and why, who was invited to that, that meeting? You know what I mean? Was it even a council of pastors or men that study the word of God or is there, was it just publishers? Like there's so much history here, guys, that the average person doesn't realize we wanted to kind of address and we address it in a, in a fun round table type of conversation. So I want to, um, just to get us started real quick today, we are going to be talking about the book of Jasher. Um, but at the, before we get going into the book of Jasher, I wanted to discuss, uh, the, the overall litmus test for all of us. And this can, this can be, you know, augmented if we need to, but, uh, this was just, the general premise that I researched that ancient councils would go by in order to try to figure out if they thought a, bo a book was inspired or not. So um, I guess I'll just read a couple of these and you guys can read a couple of these. If you like, can we get us going through for the audience sake? We'll read these aloud. And then um, was the writing associated with the recognized prophet priest or apostle? Does the writing have any evidence of historical use among those in faith and belief of the almighty and his son? Yeshua of Nazareth. Does the writings have consistency of teaching in accordance with Deuteronomy 13 and 18, um, also aligning with the teachings of the Messiah and prophets? Now, the Deuteronomy 13 and 18, for those of you who are unaware, this is what Ken and I have talked about emphatically in previous seasons. This is the idea that if a book is making a claim of prophecy and that prophecy doesn't come true, well, then you failed the Deuteronomy 13 and 18 test. Or if a prophet within that book is telling you to do different things, and the prophets of Yahweh, then you failed the Deuteronomy 13 test. So very important, very, very important. An example <laughs> of that, Sean, would be the book of Adam and Eve, correct? Absolutely, yeah. When we went through that, there was some failed prophecies that we discovered when we were going through it, which would, you know, relegate that book to the bin, rightfully so. So <laughs> right. we're not we're not always pro. People always say, you guys, when you guys do these shows, you're always just pro, pro, pro the books. We've done some other books that we've given a thumbs down to uh, because of, this requisite that's up on your screen. So yeah. we're, we're trying to do our due diligence in that sense. Yeah. Ken, do you want to read a couple of these? Yeah, sure. So was the writing confirmed by Christ, a prophet, priest, or apostle? Does the writing bear evidence of high moral and spiritual values that would reflect a work of the Holy spirit? Was the author an apostle prophet or priest, or did he have a close connection possibly as a scribe to an apostle, prophet, or priest. And so an example of that one, Sean, would be Baruch, correct? Right, exactly. Baruch well, being yeah, a scribe. Kind of, he, he fits both. I mean, he was a both a prophet and a priest and Technically, a scribe, yeah. but he was also connected to Jeremiah the prophet. Yeah. So, Josh, you want to read the last one? Yeah, sure. And is the writing profitable for teaching, repro reproof, correction, and instruction for right living consistent with bringing encouragement and hope toward the gospel of the kingdom of God as taught and brought about through Christ Jesus, the son of the almighty. So I put my own wording into that last premise. So when I was reading uh, some different, some different um, litmus tests that people had done in the past, different councils in the past, um, 
they didn't use this wording for the last one. I changed it to more modern wording, <laughs> what I thought would be more accurate wording. But they basically said, does it, is it theologically congruent with what the other books that they already accepted teach? Yeah. But to me, that was just so vague that can be malleable. And I don't think that's a good idea. So like I said, this litmus test here, as we all start talking about it, as we use it as a, as a hermeneutic lens, we can tweak this. If we feel like there's something missing, there may be something else should add it to this. Um, or maybe one of these doesn't seem appropriate that should be taken away. You guys let me know. You're welcome to chime on, chime in and let me know your thoughts. Um, so, so far, does everyone think that these, what, seven principles, these seven hermeneutic principles, do you think that they are appropriate for what we're about to do? I, I think they stand pretty strong. As a matter of fact, the, the very last one down there, you know, uh, coming from second Timothy three, um, I, I, I think that it needs to hit all those marks. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. And just knowing where your Bible comes from. I mean, we had people come over that were trying to get us to come to their church. And when my wife was questioning them things about the Bible, because we'd been looking into where our Bibles came from, the manuscripts and all that things that we had never, you know, you feel like you can't question as a believer because you're told this is the inspired word of God. There's no other translation like it. And, and so um, you can't question that. And so when we started questioning it, they, when we asked them, where did their Bibles come from? Like they didn't know. And they had the same thing. Like we shouldn't be asking these questions. We just know that we have to trust that God um, had his hand in bringing me these words. And that's, you know, that's good to trust. But it's like at the same time, you got to look at that history and see, because there's memes going out there that are scaring people away from the modern day canon in the Bible, because it'll be like King James wrote. Um, what was that book? Demonology. So the, the Bible's, he wrote the Bible and they'll, they'll literally say on their memes that he wrote the Bible, that King James literally <laughs> wrote the Bible and people that don't know will just throw a Bible out the door because um, they're so easily misled um, by these false teachings and misconceptions because there's people out there obviously trying to discredit the word. And so we have to be careful by, by questioning canon. We're not saying that the canon is bad. We're just looking at where it came from, why certain books were removed and um, how we have what we have today and the, di the many different variations. I mean, you go to Bible Gateway, there's like tons of translations in there. Why? And why do some of them say different things? So there's obviously bias, you know. So it's good to uh, study these things out. It's really changed my life. It's had me reading books like Enoch and, thing and Jubilees that have literally changed the way I walk and brought me closer to walking the way the Word actually tells me to, as opposed to the doctrines of men that have been so deep inside these creeds and um, yeah. influenced by these canons. That's a great yes. point, Josh. Did mm -hmm. Many people don't know the average uh, modern day copyright process for why there are so many different Bible translations. And uh, I remember hearing Ken Hoven, Ken Hoven talking about this many years ago in his presentations, like in the early nineties. And he was explaining mm -hmm. that, um, now he was a, pretty sure he was a KJV only guy back then, but mm -hmm. he was explaining that the reason why there's all these different translations is because, um, there is a copyright law that it has to be like at least 10% different um, in how it's worded and how it comes across. And so they basically just imagine, imagine someone says, I don't like the manuscript, the Greek manuscripts they use for the new Testament. So therefore I'm going to create a new translation. And, but if I use, even though the words that I think can be translated better uh, to give more richness to the text, it still is like, you know, 95% like what's already out there. So the, they're just making minute changes. So if they want to get it published, they then got to go reword things. They got to change around the sentence structure. They got to pull out the thesaurus and choose a different word here and there and just try to make it seem different. That's why so many of them can read so differently is because they're trying to pass the qualifier so they can get it printed without a plagiarism lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, the, whoever printed the previous Bible, if it's too much like that, they'll, they'll follow a lawsuit against the new company for plagiarism. And uh, because it's a published work sold for profit, people don't realize that. So this is why the, the, the translation sounds so different, or this is why they'll they'll even stop translating in a in a, uh, a facet to where it's understandable, and they'll just do a word for word translation, like with the um, it's called the liter literary literal translation Young, Young's, version Young's, or something like that. Yeah, Young's Young's liter literal translation. And so um, yeah, people just the average person's not aware. Um, 
And of course, atheists and agnostics, they, you know, they make fun of that idea. Oh, there's so many translations. And same thing with Muslims, right? They'll say, oh, there's so many translations of the Bible. How do you know what's true? Not really understanding the, you know, the publishing and the copyright process. And so yeah. just that's a good FYI for people to keep in mind. I don't think we talked about that at all in season three. So it's a good reminder for folks. Yeah, exactly. Guys, it's also a good reminder real quick, Sean, that our Bible obviously hasn't been the same throughout the millennia. Sure. Correct. Like you can trace back to different councils, different different parts of you know the earth where men have resided and formed councils and decided to have these types of discussions and deliberate as to what book to keep and what not to keep. A lot of people don't know, Sean. People who you know would trust in the creeds like the Nicene Creed in the fourth century and the, the creeds that came out of it. They trust that the validity of that, the the authentic um, established words and creeds that came out of that, but they don't know that that very creed itself canonized a different Bible than the Protestant canon currently has today. So like the, for instance, first and second uh, Ezra's were included in that canon. Revelation was excluded. They don't, they don't realize that. And then if you fast forward to the 16th century with Martin Luther, he wanted mm -hmm. to get rid of first Jude, James, Revelation, Hebrews. And he did successfully for a few years. Wow. So all that to say is, God didn't send uh, an angel to tell people these are the amount of books that you got to keep. This is this, you know, the Bible that you have currently is the one. Because if you're to do that in today's day and age, all you have to do is hop over the, the pond to a different country and they'll, they'll do the same thing, but they've got different books in there. Right. So it's not saying that we can't trust God, we can't trust his word. It's just that, you know, Satan and his minions, along with men who've followed after them have decided to confuse things and to displace the word as much as they can. But all that said, God's word still exists. We could still get the, the main thrust of the message, which is the gospel, gospel of the kingdom. And it's in every canon. It's in every, you know, right. Bible that's that in existence today and has been in existence. So, yeah. I like that we're playing on this, uh, the, the, the council idea here. I think that's really cool. Um, but I think with any of the councils uh, where we can see thinning or thickening of what is considered to be uh, scripture, I think we can see that there's a type of agenda that can be recognized throughout history, um, one way or the other, good or bad. And uh, so I also think we should have an agenda. And I think we all do in that seeking truth. So I'm excited about this. Awesome. Yeah, and Sean, I know one of the things that you said that actually stuck with me a while back was, you know, people kept asking you, what what version of the Bible do you recommend? What, Bible, what version of the Bible do you read? And you were like, as many as possible. And <laughs> I think that's such a wise way to go about it because, you know, there is so many leans and directions and, you know, who's who kind of who's really getting behind the scenes on what words are being translated, how, and what is this 5% difference? You know, maybe it might not be for the good. It may be for the good. So the more that you read, the more those things are going to jump out of the page of, Hey, the congruency here has been, it's been this word four out of five times. So maybe this one is off where if you're just so stuck behind one version or one canon, you may have missed it altogether and never known that it was something to even be missed in the first place. Yeah, that's right. Um, so guys, uh, are y'all like, are y'all ready to dig in? <laughs> so what I wanted to do with the book of Joshua, like we talked about previously is give, give each of us, um, since there's multiple uh, contributors here on the panel today, I want to give each of us a uh, five minutes, basically, right? Like I, like I encouraged uh, before we did the show, let's take some notes on Jasher, what we like, what we don't like, what historical research we could find on it. And let's just give each other about five minutes um, in, in succession that we can present that information. You don't have to have slides, but you can just talk about or read off what your notes are. Um, because I don't, I don't ask people to prepare slides. It's fine. But at the same time, after each person's done and you don't have to take all five minutes if, because <laughs> you know, some books may not take that long, but this is a big book. There's a, there's a lot of claims made in this book. So you may not, um, you, there may be some things that you want to bring up that you want us to talk about. So after each person shares their five minutes, then the council <laughs> will get to talk about your notes and your thoughts about from your five minutes. Does that sound okay? That's good. That'll do. Yeah. Cool. Jonathan, would you like to go first? Oh man, that would be great. Okay. I'll take this challenge. As long as you guys don't beat me up too bad. <laughs> it's all right, brother. Go ahead. 
Hey, right, this yeah, is so... this isn't this is the council. Nice to see you. There's no slapping. I just want to. <laughs> I, I want to. You know, how to dodge. There's no slap bars. <laughs> Yeah, so that you know, I think it's very interesting that we get to open this book. And I wanted to kind of start off with the idea that, <clears throat> you know, when we're starting to look into more things, Enoch, Julie's, 12 Patriarchs, you know, it's like, hey, there's way more stuff out there. We should now open the door, open the floodgates to everything. And I love that as we're going through that process, it's, hey, some things need to be screened. Some things need to be sifted. And I love that, you know, just here in the small group, we're already saying it doesn't matter that it was considered, it might have been, it's in a, a library somewhere. We don't just accept everything. Um, and I think some people are worried when you say, oh, I'm going to read outside of the 66 that now everything's on the table. And maybe it's on the table to be looked at, to be viewed like we had earlier with the different ways we're going to test it. And, you know, you guys brought up the verses that I would have said anyway, Second Timothy 3.16, Deuteronomy 13 are, are key and paramount for that. But one of the things that jumped off the page very first page of Jasher. You open it up, flip to page one, chapter one. And it starts off with talking about the creation of man. And it just somehow, it seems to me, at least reading through it, it skipped all the things that happened before man. It's just, okay, and then Adam and Eve. And you're like, okay, well, so maybe there was some more to the story. Maybe it just kind of picked up along the way. And I thought that was a very interesting detail. Why is it leaving that out? Why is it not starting off with like Genesis or Jubilees where it's starting off with the creation of, the light and the earth and the water and all that kind of stuff. So I thought that was something that really jumped off the page to me. And then, you know, I'm kind of, it's like, well, let's go about halfway through the book and see what's going on there. And I was reading about Moses and Cush and I was like, well, I don't really know what this story is about. So you kind of digging into it a little bit and seeing that Moses is a leader of, in charge, I guess, in Africa. So you know, that's something that was new and different that, you know, didn't line up like we talked about earlier. Two things are the same. One's different. Maybe we should kind of get back into that and say there's some more to test here. There's some more ideas and concepts. But the hard part throughout the whole thing was I'm reading my Bible, my 66, and I see a, a quote that says, as in the book of Jasher. I was like, well, this is going to be a problem because if my Bible's telling me to go back and refer to this and the thing that I'm going back to refer to is incorrect or has been changed, altered, adjusted, what do I do with that? Because I want to be a good Berean, a good Bible scholar, and if my Bible's telling me to do something, I should want to do that. But I'd flip to the book here that's available to us, and there's some inconsistencies. There's some things that don't quite line up. And so when, as I'm kind of going through and further auditing and further checking, there's many books that are mentioned. You know, we have the book, the book, The War of the Lo the Wars of the Lord, Visions of the Edo, the seer, history of Nathan, the prophet. There's all these other books that are kind of mentioned throughout 66 that either are unavailable, completely untested or lost. So, you know, when we kind of look at it that way, we have to kind of go back and understand where Jasher came from, who wrote it, what is the earliest manuscripts. So down that vein, I'm really starting to get into the weeds. And I was like, oh, boy, here we go. You know, you get onto the website with the really small letters and you have a lot of reading to do. But I'm digging in, and it's kind of showing me that there isn't a lot of historicity behind it. There's not a lot of ancient manuscripts. You know, we're going back to Enoch. I was like, okay, you know, we find that in the, the Qumran caves, Bethabara. But then yet we're missing Jasher in that, in that same place. So now we're, we're kind of seeing some gap between some of the books that we've tested versus Jasher. So it's starting to get further and further away for me personally from that same ability to test, to read into, and to try to understand. And I know for me, at least, one of the biggest parts that just jumped off the page. I was really trying to dig in. I was really trying to learn some stuff because I was like, well, I know about the plagues. I know about Moses, and I know about uh, Pharaoh and all that. And you start reading in chapter 80 of Jasher, and it gets a little funky on what they're talking about and, and the way these plagues are playing out with the frogs and the lice and, you know, the, it's the whole chapter. If you get in there and just kind of dig around and see how these plagues are listed versus how they're listed in the, in the canon, there's a lot in there that I was not really sure about, not really comfortable just keeping that as my new and believable theology, something that I needed to say. I'll look at it. I might put it on the shelf. And whenever I'm going back through canon, going back through scripture and other references, does it fit or does it not fit? So far... I'm seeing it to not fit, and it seems a bit science fiction, and by a bit, I mean a lot, but it's definitely getting a little science fiction uh, from, from my taste. So those were some of the things that 
I wanted to bring to the table and definitely share with you guys and see uh, how bad or how good those <laughs> came across. <laughs> no, it's great. That's great, brother. I, um, I can echo that sentiment in a way I was, uh, when I first started reading Jasher, um, that's when I was actually first introduced to, to the concept of there being additional books. And so I kind of went into Jasher with this zeal and I was like, Oh, okay, cool. Like I just assumed, um, I'm not going to say what version of the Bible it was that I was reading from, but it had apocryphal books in it. And the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the the author of the of the bible the guy who uh, interpreted it or made it compiled it he basically made it sound like in the introduction uh, pages that dasher's like legitimate so i had this like okay like i'm gonna take his word for it type of approach and this was several years ago and so i'm reading this thing and i i was mesmerized by it to be honest with you like i i was mm -hmm. like oh this is so cool like there's so much more craziness i'm someone who loves Enoch. I was I like, you know, when you're reading in Genesis, Enoch, this guy that was so godly, so godly that he was apparently taken up to heaven. Right. Um, <laughs> and you just get this brief mention of him. So I was just like, uh, like where, where's there more about him? Why, why don't we have any more writings that pertain to him and his life and what he's done? So first Enoch to me was amazing. So as I'm reading Jasher and coming across Enoch, um, I was like, oh, wow, okay, we get some more about Enoch, right? And that's actually where I discovered as uh, I was testing this book that uh, there were some issues for sure. I don't know if you guys encountered that with Enoch, but um, like a little brief synopsis on that particular part of the book. I think it's, is it chapter four? Yeah. I think so, yeah. That sounds right, yes. Yeah, chapter, it's like the chapter, there's a couple chapters that are, um, pertaining to him but chapter three and four basically describes enoch as ascending into heaven a chariot comes down in elijah like form takes him away from men brings him up to heaven to rule over the sons of god so it, it there's no you can't misinterpret what it's trying to teach you there it, it's saying that it took him to heaven to rule over the angels essentially and so that bothered me because right away, you know, as we had the prerequis the requisite up on the screen there, it contradicts the words of Christ. It said that no one, no one can, has ever can ascend to heaven except for the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man, right? So there, I'm like, okay, that, that's that's not very good because the Book of Enoch, as well as Jubilees, don't ever describe Enoch's removal as going up above the firmament, whereas Jasher does, and so. In fact, it, it actually says that he's taken into the garden, which was still on the earth, um, which made perfect sense to me. But the book of Jasher doesn't describe that at all. And so that started to uh, bother me a little bit. Um, I'm sure you guys are aware of 2 Timothy 3, 8, where it says, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men of deprived mind, disqualified in regard to faith. So I was like, oh, okay, Paul... He's mentioning these two guys, Janice and Jammers, by name. You know, how does he know that information, right? Book of Jasher does mention them. So I thought, okay, th does that lend to the validity of the book? So then again, I was kind of like juggling. I'm like, all right, like mm -hmm. this Enoch stuff doesn't work. But yet it seems like Paul might be endorsing the writing. Um, but then there's just, there's so many more passages as you continue to read that contradict the rest of our established canon of 66 the protestant canon um i mean we got so many but well, I, I wanted you guys opinion before we get into all that stuff um where it says in joshua the whole and a lot of people want to go to joshua uh 10 13 about how it says in the sun of the moon stood still until god executed vengeance on their enemies and the sun stood still in the midst of heaven it did not proceed to set till the end of one day. And then it says this is not written in the book of Jasher. It actually doesn't say that in the Septuagint. Mm. That it mm. is not written in the book of Jasher is not in the Septuagint version. So to me, that's that's interesting that that ends up in the Masoretic version, especially when we look at the history of Jasher, you know, the, uh, the manuscript sources that we are aware of seem like what the earliest manuscript that they've been able to to land on is about the 16th 17th century ish yeah okay i'm 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 trying to follow all you guys and, and be the scribe here so um maybe i should 
don't know if I can put this on screen or not, but um, I'm trying to take some notes because Ken, you're going fast. And uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, man. Five minutes, right? <laughs> well, no, I thought we were just going to review Jonathan's five minutes first, and then and then go oh. to somebody else. My bad. Okay. So okay. that so that way we have a chance to kind of dissect what he says and take some notes and and. So what I'm doing right here, I'm sorry. I know this is the first time we try in this format. So what I'm doing right here is I'm, I'm just, I'm taking notes with like, um, these are the things that, that John, John, Jonathan said were cons against the book. And yeah. I just wanted to validate because I, I was about to start writing all yours down too. Cause, but cause I think you got yeah. a list to, to read off of. Um, <laughs> I do. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to, I want to record them for us all. And then I want to make these available to people later. So um, yeah. So anyway, that's that's all I was trying to get at was if you're going to go into historical validation, I gotta, I gotta follow. So yeah, 100%. Um, yep. What were you saying about well, in your research? You you found uh, the first work, the Hebrew work, goes back to the 1600s. Is that what you said? Yeah, the 1600s. Um, I believe it was. I mean, what I found was the earliest edition we have today was printed in Venice in 1625. But you guys were saying that you found something that said the 1500s eh? i didn't see anything that said 1500 yeah, other my, than my just... earliest one shows 1552 okay i'm just gonna put 1600s as a general premise i yeah. like catch roll yeah but i agree with jonathan what he said about how uh the desi scrolls um oh, that community they what books they venerated likely would have been compiled in those caves and you know those manuscripts of jasher don't seem to be there unless they're you know unless they come up i know they're still digging around there but um so far they're not they're not there and they didn't seem like that community really cared much about that book if it really did exist at that time and to be fair i mean there were uh, supposedly as the story goes you know there was uh some scrolls that were sold and and other things had been done with them potentially destroyed or, or whatever before it was realized what oh. these what these uh, scrolls were and the significance and value of them. So um, as the story goes, you know, that it's potential that there were more books available, more scrolls available that were just, we don't know what they were because of what happened to them mm. potentially. So, yeah. <clears throat> Is this showing, can you guys see this? Okay. So when, hang on a second. If I, if I type, will it show it? I'm not seeing you typing right now. Yeah, one second here. Um, there you go. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. There okay. it is. All right. So, so far I got um, earliest edition printed around the 1600s, not found in Dizzy Scrolls. Can you mention the Masoretic references are not found in the Septuagint? Um, At least for jo uh, Joshua. Right. Yeah, for they are. They are in, in some, well, that is, uh, Samuel. What about First Samuel? Is it in there? Um, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Was there fragments of it found in the Dead Sea Scrolls? I thought there was like small little bits of Jasher in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I could be wrong, but I don't have my Dead Sea Scrolls Bible with well, me. I've I've never heard that. Have you guys heard that? No, I'm to the understanding okay. that there was. Maybe I could be wrong. Jasher. It was like, yeah, I haven't heard that either. Well, here's the issue, though. Jasher, it would be, it would you know, it would depend on like there is there is things from that that are congruent with genesis in jasher sure you know so someone finds something that's that aligns with with genesis how do they know it's genesis or jasher if it's literally just repeating the same phrase right so i don't know or jubilees or, or jubilees yeah exactly and that's the problem with not finding complete manuscripts but they find in those scraps you know yeah mm -hmm. that's true you know i talked about on my 42 series recently, I talked about this new technology that they have. I can't remember the incident, I think Helsinki Institute. And it basically does like a, a infrared scan of a scroll that's rolled up and it can digitally unroll it by infrared scanning the layers that are rolled up. And it can, and it can like, it's so sensitive. It can even discern the, the, the type that that's printed on the scroll on the paper, even though it's rolled up. And so once they unroll it, they can then extrapolate it into sentences as if it was a digitally being unrolled and read. That's and cool. um, they've been doing that with Assyrian texts that they found in Babylon or in Iraq. <clears throat> so it's crazy. I think it's pretty wild if they did that to some Dead Sea Scrolls. 
Yeah, that's that's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, okay. I apologize, Jonathan. I didn't I didn't mean to jump over and I just I, I thought we were just hopscotching with our five minutes there and then talking about it afterwards. My bad. That, that oh, makes no sense. worries. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I just don't think we'll remember. Time. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just I I just wanted to like take turns because I, I won't be able to remember everybody's statements. Um personally. I don't know about you guys, but especially Ken, sounds like you you're raring to go. So I I got a lot of notes I need to take with you. So I need to make sure I can get them all down. <laughs> Sure thing, right? Um, Jonathan, what was, what was, um, uh, so you listed off these three cons or are these accurate to let's see here? Are these accurate to what you said? Um, creation of heaven's earth details are missing. Um, uh, Moses's time in Cush is not, yep. it can't be corroborated basically. Yep. That, that works singular um testimony mm -hmm. um, yeah the plagues against egypt have inconsistent descriptions compared to exodus yep. and then just uh like i said just what that we should uh when we open the open the books and we let everything in you know we do have to test and screen so that was just that was a, a point off the off the beginning of it's good to look at different books. It's good to open up the ideas and concepts, especially once you learn that the canon of 66 isn't sealed, wasn't originally sealed. So, you know, letting things come in and out, we even have to be a little more careful on what we're testing because technically everything would want to come in and not everything should be in. Okay. But is that a critique against Jasher or is that just your commentary about the process? Yep. Just the process. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm sorry. I just, I'm so did you have any pros that you read uh, through Jasher that you thought were suspicious? Um, they, positive? Yeah. So kind of like what we talked about um, a little bit throughout is the, with the pros, um, there is not any direct points, but I think that there was some consistency throughout the stories or some things that line up. Um, you know, I could do that if I was writing a book today, but um, a lot of the pros for me get negated because there's so many cons of, you know, large theological issues. So I, I'm afraid to even throw out pros because I, I, I don't want it to overshadow uh, some of the issues that I found. So um, okay. for pros, I didn't really have any positive points to uh, to keep. Okay. 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 Awesome. Awesome, brother. I appreciate it. I'm sorry, Ken. <laughs> no, it's all good, man. All right, brother. Good. I'd love to hear your thoughts for your five minutes. <laughs> All right. Go back. Yeah, to I know. Let's, re let's rewind <laughs> a lot of that. Are we going to talk about each other's pros and cons, though, or what? Well, that's that's what like, I was. Can we give we count? Like, do just. I was trying to open the floor for that just now, but okay. Okay. So I'm getting it. Any... This we're just we're working up the kinks here right because i don't know sure. like i've never been in a council like, <laughs> so I, don't have, I don't have council like <laughs> yeah. you know i'm personal. not i'm not banging a gavel and saying point of order uh you know next guy like none of that i'm just trying to make it as simple free flow as possible each person has five minutes to talk and then after that we all talk about what they said and then we'll go to somebody else yeah. so if you guys have any other commentary on what jonathan said now's now's the time for sure i'll i'll address his cons real quick me personally i don't i don't have a problem the creation of the heavens and the earth details being missing and it just starting with the creation of man i think there's other books like the apocalypse of abraham where there's like moments there where you know we just don't get any of the details that are in that book in the book of genesis but it doesn't in my opinion doesn't make it valid if it's missing same with the second with moses's time in cush um moses could have been in cush you know what i mean just because genesis doesn't say doesn't mean it couldn't happen so i don't i don't personally have a problem with that whereas the third one the plagues I agree. I didn't, if I recall correctly, the, the plagues did seem inconsistent with the details and how they worked compared to Exodus. So that's, that's one that for sure I would agree with. But uh, the other two, I don't, I don't personally have a, an issue with, I don't know what you guys think, but. Well, I'll say the quick reason why the, the Kush thing came in was just because it says his reign. So it was, it wasn't just that he was there. It was that he was like in charge or the King or whatever. And I, I thought that part may have been more of the issue. Um, just to adjust yeah. that. No, yeah, I hear you. He he was, like... Go ahead. I was just going to say, and I guess he was like imprisoned by Ruel Jethro for like, what, 10 years or something like that, which is, again, I don't have a problem necessarily with that. It could have happened when he left Egypt, fled Egypt and went into that land. Um, 
you know, and then he was left that let out or whatever. I don't have a problem with that. It doesn't to me contradict anything, but it's yeah, it is. It, these are weird details that we're just not familiar with. So it sounds a little off. So I understand. Yeah. So it, to this point about Kush, Gr Cleve is right. He beat me to it. Um, hi Bob, hope you're doing well. This is Ethiopia is ancient Kush. Mm-hmm. So Ethiopia today has an extensive canon that's a larger canon than in most churches, church communities around the world. And they never included Jasher. If Moses was truly there as a king over their ancient forefathers, you think that would have been talked about, venerated, written about, like, and and not in the, you know, and put in their canon. You think they would still be talking about it? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, because if people, if you research the history of Ethiopia, they've had a, the longest standing canon in all of Christendom. And yep. so, I mean, they, and they, if you go even back to the fifth century, uh, or I should say, um, go back to the eighth and ninth century BC and under the, the offshoots of Solomon's empire, he established in Elephantine Island what was formerly the territory of Ethiopia, but then became a part of the, the Egypt later. There's change of hands over time, but he established um, a library down there with that have a whole bunch of manuscripts I'd love to get into later in the future. But um, And Solomon had all these outposts um, that extended all the way down to Ethiopia uh, as a part of his reign of his kingdom. This is why there's all the legends in Ethiopia about Solomon sleeping with the Queen of the South, which was one of their queens that came to visit him. How there is a genetic lineage from that that one night union. Technically, the legend claims it was like a fourteen day seduction period that Solomon was trying to seduce this woman. But basically, they when she went back home to Ethiopia, they all venerate her as being a a wife of Solomon. Like they, you know, that was a huge thing that they still talk about. But they never talk about Moses being a king over their ancient peoples. Right. right. So to me, this is. You know, this is where it gives me Mormon vibes, you know, as far as like the history of the North America and all these ancient kingdoms. And, you know, you start getting you start getting Book of Mormon vibes, in my opinion. Uh, going back to the creation aspect, um, I, I, I didn't so much see a problem with the the things that were left out during the creation aspect. Um, but. It, we still should leave that little caveat as to okay, this is left out now. Why? And then as the as the the, the story unfolds, as it continues, is is there a, is there an intention for that, or is it just these are details that need to be here, and now we'll go on and continue the rest of the story? So, so I think always keeping that question in the back of our minds when we're studying this stuff out as to why is it left out? If something is left out, uh, is always a good thing, but just just on its own the fact that it didn't have all the other details wasn't that big of a deal to me either so. yeah i agree with um i agree with ken on that as far as like there's lots of books that don't say certain information that other books do we, we talk about this idea about oh you need to cross-reference and compare other books so you get the fuller context um i so i'm torn i'll be honest with you because it's going to come up and again, again later <laughs> But I'm kind of torn on this point that Jonathan brought up because I do think it it is weird to call this the book of the correct record and not actually mention the creation. But then later it goes into detailing a record that they, they make so many mistakes in other records that they're detailing. And then later I'll give mine during my five minutes, but there this will come up again later. So. so I'm kind of torn on this. Like I agree with the sentiment Ken and, and, and Kyle and Josh are saying like, doesn't quite it's not quite a con but at the same time it's very suspicious what they choose to include and what they don't right yep so very cool josh anything uh did you um, already give yours commentary or oh no I, I was just thinking you know like i was a lot like ken when i first came into this book i was looking at it like oh my goodness this is one of the lost books it's kind of more valid and um it, it's a really good book uh, it's easy to read. I, I can say, I guess when you've read a lot of other books, it's like, this one's easy to read. It's captivating. It, it gets your imagination going. And, um, it, and sometimes even books like this, even if it is a forgery, um, when you're reading it, it gets you to look at things differently and see 
um, even like Genesis a little differently. Like, um, like I, when you're reading about Cain and Abel and it has their back and forth, like it's something that's really cool, but it also, it makes you think of things new that you had never thought of when um, reading Genesis, you know, like, like just the other day when I was reading it, I was thinking about how Cain, when he killed Abel, I never really thought of it much of, of this first person being killed, according to the Bible, was an innocent shepherd, you know, like just that whole premise there. I miss that, you know, and this and, and Jasher tells you he was feeding his sheep when he was killed, you know, and he'd just done this um, sacrifice that was acceptable to the most high. And then he was put, you know, right after he's put to death. So, I mean, things like that, it kind of you can still benefit from it, you know, so I feel like um, the benefit from it is that it kind of gets you. It's kind of like watching an it, as something that's like a biblical movie, if it's even though it's not exactly like the Ten Commandments movie isn't one hundred percent accurate, like it still gets you more into reading those stories and it gives you a visual of what's going on in their minds. The people building the Tower of Babel, um, just there's how zealous they would have been. Like I first got that imagination just from reading the Book of Jasher. Like these people, if somebody falls, they didn't even look. And and that, that to me that just sounds like what would have really happened, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like the uh, the author kind of took creative license to just, you know, flesh out the story a little bit more than what, you know, we're used yeah. to type thing. Like what Sean's doing with Days of Noah a little bit, right? You're adding yeah. a little bit of flair to it, a little extra dialogue that we don't see anywhere. Um, and that'd be funny if that's actually what this book is really is. Just some, some dude <laughs> who's just like yeah. um, expounding a little more on things and then it just ends up lost and someone finds it. It's like, oh, what's this? Yeah. Well, that that's funny you mention that, guys, because that is that is what the Talmud does, and yeah. this is where I think that it's interesting rush. that this book is is uh, openly acknowledged uh, to be a part of the Talmud, the Midrash. So, or not the Midrash, but the uh, they call it the uh, Toledot Adam, and so it's um it's it's in the Talmud. Wow. Yep. So there's there. I'll have more to say on that when it's my mm-hmm. turn, but. All right. How are we doing? You you, you, kept, you keeping up with us there? Scratch yeah, up? I just put this on screen. I don't know if you guys agree with it or not, but one of the pros that Josh brought up was that it draws oh. further positive interest to inspired books already accepted. Do we need to read the minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have the treasurer go. I'll go get us a, a Pepsi. So, um, what a, Sean, I'll add a pro. Since, okay. You know, um, so for me, it was 2 Timothy 3a, like I said before. Uh the mention of the names of Janus and Jambres, the two magicians that opposed Moses, um, not in the canon of 66 anywhere are those names mentioned specifically. And so, you know, the book of Joshua does give us those names, which originally when I had read the book, I thought, oh, okay, maybe that, uh, you know, lends, lends to its validity that this thing is authentic and real and trustworthy. So there's that. Although I guess the names Janus and Jambres are in other texts too, apparently. I don't know what which ones, but I've only been able to find them in Jasher. Yeah. I don't know what, what other, what other uh, text has them. I'd be curious to know if there is any. Yeah. So this is what um, I joked about last night after the show amongst some of us that were in the studio, which is where we get into correlating names, places, and sequence sequence of events. And can that be a legitimate case to become to build to build towards what we talked about up here which is does it make it inspired so like in in this hermeneutic view and i'm on the fence about this this is why i'm bringing it up i need you guys opinion on this so if we see something that's i w- i wouldn't say like the fact that Janice and jamries or the fact that it mentions a guy named moses or mentions after him joshua succeeded him or you know what i'm saying they went to the land of canaan all those details are correct they're all in Jasher. But does that make it inspired if I just because it does align with Genesis, Exodus, and Joshua, Joshua, and things like that? Is 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 it is um how do I say this? Um not synchronicity, I guess, I guess synchronicity, but it's not is basically just having the same the same people, places, and events, even though there's some anachronistic problems with Jasher, uh, because there's things that are translated from Latin because it's it was a published as a later work in the 1600s, like we talked about. Mm -hmm. So even though there's some problems there, we also see anachronistic problems in Genesis, the Masoretic Genesis. I'm actually preparing a whole video on that uh, later. So, Oh boy. uh, 
Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm telling you guys, if anyone has a toe, I'm going to step on it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so basically, like, so I have to ask myself the same question when I'm validating and I'm thinking about stuff. Like, just because it mentions Enoch and it, and it gives, you know, the lifespan of, of Enosh and Mahalalel and Methuselah, and they're all born in the same order, you know, does that make it an inspired work because it has the same people, places, and names of locations? No, no, I would say not. Okay. Not necessarily. So, I'm just, I too wonder the same thing, Ken. Mm -hmm. I'm like, where did Paul get these names? Yeah, because well, he was a rabbi. He was a rabbi, right? I mean, he was part of Judaism, <laughs> right? So he had all that knowledge too that I'm sure he, you know, touched and, on a little bit throughout time. But and uh, say, say that they did have the names of these dudes. Say they did know the actual name of the Pharaoh that Moses stood up against, which historians argue about in time immemorial. You know what I'm saying? That, But that doesn't mean what's being taught from it or the historical account that, that flows from those accurate names um, is accurate. And it doesn't mean it's wrong either. I'm trying to be fair about this. Um, I'm just trying to say this. I hope to, to spur the audience to think critically about this stuff. And not just because, oh, I like this one because it includes a story. You know, mm -hmm. like there's some fascinating stories in the book of Jasher, guys. Yeah. Fascinating yeah. story. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I'll stop there. But yeah, Ken, I'd love to hear your thoughts if, if you guys are all for all. Yeah, finished sure. About Jonathan. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I guess the uh, the Septuagint, Joshua 10, 13, not specifically even having that phrase uh is this not written in the book of Jasher, whereas in the Masoretic text, that phrase is there. Um, although I'm not sure how much weight we can put on that because the phrase is in the Septuagint in 2 Samuel, but it's worded differently. It's like, is this not in the book of the upright or something like that, which I guess is what Jasher can mean in English, upright, righteous one or whatever. Um, so I don't know. Like I, To me, looking into the different versions the sub the greek Septuagint and the, and the the hebrew masoretic text um my mind wonders if there's um any influence with regards to like judaism like we know if you guys are familiar with the church fa early church fathers the 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 anti-nicene church fathers a lot of times especially justin martyr he likes to you know pick on the jews of that time saying you guys you know spliced and sliced things out of books and you know, did a lot of mischievery with these copies. You didn't like the uh, the Septuagint, essentially the one that Ptolemy commissioned the Hebrew scribes at the time to do. You didn't like that. And he's calling them out. And to me, I'm like, well, I wonder if this was like a phrase that the Masoretic version kind of stuck in there. It's just not written in the book of Jasher to make the audience look into the book, their book of Jasher, which is a mid, like Sean was saying, it's like a midrash. It's like their, their own commentary, their own versions of how they want the narrative to flow. They can, you know what I mean? It almost leads you to what they want you to read. So I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if that's valid or not, but I kind of had that feeling, um, especially the more I studied the Septuagint and just the history of that, along with the early church fathers, like I said, mentioning just how much these, uh, you know, these men were messing with the text at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And that's, I mean, that's a side of like the actual, like I have, a, like I said, a bunch of verses here out of yeah, yeah, that go ahead, brother. just contradictory or whatever. Okay. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make this too stale guys. I'm just trying to keep some sense of like uh, logic to it so we can record this so that people can yeah. have a, um, some sort of like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Um, maybe we should have had a whole like meeting before we did the broadcast about <laughs> how we're going to do this, but I'm, I'm trying to like make this as, as, um, as free flowing as possible, just to say, everyone gets five minutes to talk, present your thoughts, pros and cons, your historical research. We can talk about what that person has just said and then move on to the next. Um, and that way we all have a turn. It should take less than an hour, but, you know, uh, and then we can, yeah, we, we can elaborate more after that if we'd like, but that way we at least have a good solid chunk for people to look at and consider on this book, pros and cons. 
Yeah. Sean, I'd like to respond to your question, but that kind of gets into what I was going to be presenting. I can kind of split that up if that's okay and maybe uh, do part of that. And then when it's my turn later on, I can bring up the individual points that I was going to reference. Would that be all right? What questions I ask? Uh, yeah, asking about the, um, does it somehow make it valid just because it brings up the um, specific names or things like that? Does that somehow validate it? Um, I was going to reference that. I, I thought okay. that was, I thought that was a question. I'm sorry if it's not. Yeah, no, it, no. It, well, some of them are rhetorical. Some are, I guess, are, are for interaction. I'm sorry. I, I'm just, I'm trying to temper myself as well. And, and instead of just free flowing into all my random thoughts as well about, because I've <laughs> studied this book for years and have my yeah. opinion about it. So I'm trying to discipline myself as well to the, to the little format that I, that I suggest that for, for the sake of the audience, otherwise it's just going to be all of us talking over each other and the audience is going to be, you know, what would they really have gained at the end of this? So, so just like in previous okay. Honor of Kings, I always try to have things on screen for people. And since we're not like going line by line through the actual 91 chapters of the text or whatever, I just figured maybe we can at least take some coherent notes as we go. Perfect. And, uh, and offer that as a service to those watching. So yeah, if you do have commentary that would bleed into your five minutes of, of notes, hold those. And then let's uh, we'll, we'll finish hearing Ken out right now. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, brother Kyle. I know this is uh, I, I'm, I'm learning how to do a council, how to be a council member here, guys. So you guys are seeing it live <laughs> audience members. We're doing this on the fly. This is how it gets done. We'll, we'll do better in uh, subsequent episodes for sure. So Sean and the rest of my council members, there was um, nice to see a you. contradiction. <laughs> There's a contradiction in chapter two. Verses 26 to 29 of Jasher, where Lamech essentially kills Cain, the son of Adam. Mm. He shoots him with an arrow and he dies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when we go, we don't see this in Genesis. We don't see the death of Cain. At least I haven't seen it written in the versions of Genesis that I've read. But in the book of Jubilees, chapter 431, which is a book that we have tested in previous seasons. And you guys, Jonathan and Kyle, uh, you know, over on your channel, you guys have been going through Jubilees line by line. Um, in Jubilees 431, it says, At the close of this Jubilee, Cain was killed after him in the same year, for his house fell upon him, and he died in the midst of his house, and he was killed by its stones. For with a stone he had killed Abel, and by a stone was he killed in righteous judgment. So that's a completely different death of Cain, the first murderer on the earth, right? So I lend, again, Sean and I have gone through Jubilees. You guys are going through Jubilees. Jubilees has quite a historical record of authenticity and validity. It's been in canons, is in a canon. Um, it's a book that I trust personally. And so I'm going to lean towards that account versus what Joshua is claiming about Cain's death there. <clears throat> I agree. Sean, may I go to another point? Or yeah, I, yeah. You, I no, I didn't mean everybody? for you to do like a segment line. Brother, you can no, just, just okay. like Jonathan did, just talk, sure. just do your five minutes of talking. I'm going to do my best to keep notes and, and keep up with you as you go. Sounds and then we good. can all discuss what you've presented after you're done. Sounds good. Yeah. So another one, uh, we'll go to Jasher 536. It says, and it was at that time, Methuselah, the son of Enoch died. 960 years old was he at his death um even as a kid so that one jumped out to me when i first read jasher i was like wait a minute methuselah was the oldest man and he was supposed to be 969 years old when he died and that's what genesis 5 27 tells us so we have a discrepancy in just the age of methuselah when he died now again is that enough to discredit the book where you know when we compare the masoretic text versus the septuagint you got some different numbers and ages and you know, gaps in regard to that. So I don't think it's necessarily enough to discredit it, but it is, again, a contradiction to the Protestant canon uh, and what it says in Genesis about Methuselah's age. Um, what else we got? So obviously there's Enoch ascending into heaven, the whole chapter three going into verse, uh, in chapter four, verse two, and says, when Enoch had ascended into heaven, all the kings of earth rose and took Methuselah, his son, anointed him and made him king. So again, this is this idea, as I said earlier, of 
a man who is made of flesh and bones, aside from Yeshua himself, cannot ascend through the heavens, cannot ascend through the firmament. Definitely not reigning as a king over the sons of God up there. The son of God is doing that, right? And he was the only one who has come down to the earth, come from heaven and ascended back to heaven because he has the body that can do that. Whereas Methuselah was not given that type of body that can accommodate that environment. So to me, that's a huge, huge contradiction. And I'll, I'll give my time over to someone else. All right, guys. What, what do we think about Ken's topics that he brought up? Well, just addressing the age aspect real quick. The, um, you know, little things like that. I mean, it, it's possible with any text to have a simple little typo, a little error, a, a misprint or whatever, right? Some, something that has happened there. Um, but we have to recognize, is this a consistent theme throughout where things are just wrong, right? Not lining up with, with things we know to be scripture. And um, so... So yeah, I think I think it's good to look at those things, but there's a lot of those things that I've seen. So yeah. a lot of you've seen like in the canon we have or just in the book of Jasher? In the book of Jasher, a lot of things that just aren't it's telling a different story. It's I see. it's give, giving completely different facts, if you will. Okay. Yeah, Ken, one of the things that stood out for me was the part about Cain's death, because I remember reading in Genesis 4, you know, it says, if anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. And, you know, I always wondered about Cain having that mark, and it almost seemed like he wouldn't be killed, like it was just not going to happen. But yet, as we read it, then he is killed. But if the, if in Jubilee's that account, if the house falls on, falls on him, that means he died. He wasn't killed. Okay. So now we're, we're almost following along with letting this occur naturally and letting the scriptures be what they are. And you, while we don't have that detail in Genesis and we get it in Jubilees, it doesn't change the meaning. Cause we don't, I don't, you know, where would we, where was, where's the account of some guy getting seven times the vengeance? You know, we would need that to also play out as well. So I think that's a great point you made. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Cause that's kind of like a prophecy in Genesis, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's like a guarantee. Like God will do this if you don't. Good that's catch. Interesting thought. All right. Very good catch. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to repeat a few things, uh, when I give my five minutes, but yeah, I agree on, on Methuselah's age as well as, um, just the big issue of Enoch ascending to heaven. <laughs> it's just a problem for me. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the, one of the most fundamental issues of the first resurrection is that we, we, we don't, no one's been resurrected and gets to heaven in a glorified body. We're in a fleshly body, definitely not in a fleshly body, but definitely not in a glorified resurrected body. You don't get, you don't get this, um, this privilege before Christ that that's mm -hmm. he's the first fruits of the first resurrection. He himself says no one has ascended to heaven except the one who comes down. Like it's, and that's also John's, John's retelling in that gospel of, of why Christ has ascended to heaven and is judged, given judgment by the father. So like, to me, this has lots of vibes of Judaism. Because there is a Kabbalistic sect of Judaism that is all yeah. about Metatron, and Enoch mm -hmm. has become Metatron in Sorry, heaven yeah. with all this authority and power. So, to me, that that gives way too much too much credence toward uh, Kabbalah, you know, the Kabbalah, basically the idea that, and it's just against the promise of the covenants. Like it's it's against you know. Um, so yeah, if you're not if you don't believe in Christ, then of course you don't have any problem writing this down. Yeah, and, and Sean, it rubs up against, again, Jubilees, because it says Enoch died in Jubilees, right? That's right. And he's not in the heavens reigning with the sons of God mm. there, so. Okay, let me yeah. put that down, too, because that's a that's something to consider. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, yeah. All right, and the other verse I believe we were reading um, is it says, it's appointed for all men to die once. So even Yeshua wasn't an exception to that. You know, everybody who's lived has died, unless you're part of the resurrection and the end time saints. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, there's there's a lot there. Um, Josh, do you want to go next? Did you already go? Sure. Um, I mean, I've said unless, a few things. Unless everyone's done commenting, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
I've said a few things, but I think last night while I'm laying there thinking, I, I'm I'm seeing the inconsistencies, you know, a few of them, but I'm like, you know, if, if you're making a forgery, I, I like to look at things from the eye of the person who's doing the deceiving. If I'm going to spend time making a forgery that I'm going to pass off as authentic, I mean, for one, you can tell they obviously knew the events of the Bible enough to add some of their own commentary and make it creative and enjoyable to read. Um, but you would get, I feel like you would get the numbers right. Like what, it just bothers me that they would get certain numbers wrong. I'm like, why, if you're going through all that work, um, you know, you could go to prison for such things, you know, it seems like back then, like, I, I don't understand why you would, why you would get numbers wrong. Like you're obviously a brilliant enough person to pull off such a forgery. I don't know. So that just last night as I'm thinking about it, I'm like, what was the purpose behind that? You know? Um, and sometimes, you know, like we've seen with even the modern day things that we have, the biases are why there's changes and things that don't add up with the Septuagint versus the Masoretic. And you don't find out why until you're listening to somebody who's like an anti-missionary talking and like, quote, you know, like going against the Messiah. And then you go back to the Septuagint and it's not what that verse says at all. Like it's totally different than what they're using in their Masoretic. Mm. Um, so with the book of Jasher, I, I, th that's the thing, like, um, I don't know there to me, it's, it's a fun read, but that's, that's about it. Like it's something fun to read. Um, and, but the most important part about reading and investigating these books is letting the Holy spirit guide you in your understanding. And, um, the Holy spirit will tell you, Hey, this is a fraud almost like right away. Like you're looking into something. It's like, that's not for me, you know, like that's not from the <laughs> most high when you're, when you're reading it. And so, um, I think that's important with modern Canon, with any, any book we pick up because there's biases of men out there that have made their way in, and it's not to scare people away from reading the word, but just, you know, let the Holy Spirit guide you. Anytime you sit down to read, you should be praying, Father, if there's something in here that's been tampered with, just let it be shown to me while I'm reading it. And, uh, and let my ears be open to you as opposed to anything that has bias. And so that's what ends up leading me down these little trails of finding answers is I'll, I'll you'll hear that voice. And then it's like, let me look into that. Um, and so when you investigate it, you end up finding out. That's why it didn't add up, because there was a change somewhere along the a manuscript. And a lot of these things that I've investigated, like the Trinity, was something I would have never investigated the creeds and all that. I didn't even know about the creeds, but it was the Holy Spirit saying, look into this. This is not true. When a preacher says something about it, it's not true. And so um, years later, you find out, man, they went through a lot of work to create something that most people think is just a, a foundation of our beliefs. And so mm -hmm. this book of Jasher, when I'm reading it, I'm looking, is there something in this book that steers people towards more of a lawless way of life or away from the Messiah and um, the the truth that we know? Like, is there something that's steering us away from that? And um, I didn't find much except for that thing with Enoch that you guys have mentioned that um, would seem to make Enoch seem like this almost Messiah-like figure. So um, as far as it being a dangerous book, I don't think that it's like super dangerous, like it's radically changed my faith and led me the wrong way, um, even if I put all my trust in it. But it would definitely um, get me to believe something that is not backed up in the word as far as the, like the thing with Enoch. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree. Even just to further elaborate on like with Enoch, apparently his face, like he would go away from the sons of men for a certain time. Then he would appear and teach them righteousness, whatever. Then he'd go away. And like there was a period at the end of that sequence where he like they couldn't even look at him because his face was so bright and so godlike. I think it describes it. And it was just like, I'm just like, yeah, what, like what Sean said, it's like this Metatron thing. Right. I don't know if you guys have read second and third Enoch specifically through Enoch, but they love this Metatron mm -hmm. Enoch, the ascended master dude. Like they yeah. just, yeah. And so to me, this feels like it's got some of those same familiar vibes going there. Um, yeah. Guys also, I'm just going to throw another one out here, Sean. It was a significant one to me, and I don't want to take anyone else's time. If I, you know, I just figured I'd do it since we're talking about like um, <laughs> just do demons. It. Yeah. Demons, unclean spirits. So in, Jasher 2 11 it says and Canaan grew up and he was 40 years old and he became wise and had knowledge and skill and all wisdom and he reigned over all the sons of men and he led the sons of men to wisdom and knowledge for Canaan was a very wise man and had understanding and all wisdom and with his wisdom he ruled over spirits and demons now this is bef way before the flood yeah where we we know the flood 
essentially, or, or when the Watchers waged, you know, the sons of the Watchers, the, the ones that 200 that Enoch talks about mated with women and created this hybrid offspring called the Nephilim, when they warred against each other, and then when the flood really wiped all of them out, that's when we see demons manifesting, right? In a kind of like a post-flood context, whereas Jasher makes it seem like Canaan was dealing with these things before they were, were supposed to be dealt with in the timeline. So that's weird. You kind of steal a method, man. Yeah. That was one of my topics. <laughs> oh, sorry, guys. I thought, same, I thought the same thing when I read that right. too, Ken. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I was guessing there's going to be overlap with some of our notes, you know. Oh, I'm sure. That's I'm fine. Sure. Um, yeah. And, and speaking of what you were saying there, Josh, the, um, uh, the contradictions and things like that. Um, is it, is it going to completely change your faith or whatever for reading it or whatever, or even believing it to be scripture? Probably not, but it, it does, definitely is going to mess up some of the details. And, um, in these, I, I try to look at scripture. Um, I try to look at all scripture the, the way I did when I first started studying. And when I first started studying it, that mindset was let every man be a liar, let your word be true. And I'm going to do my part in testing all things, right? I'm going to study these things out to the nth degree. And so I kind of had this almost atheist mindset when I went into studying. It's like, okay, I'm going to challenge everything, right? Every word, every little nook and cranny. And um, one of the challenges or one of the, 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 the questions that, that an atheist will pose is about all the so-called um, contradictions in Scripture, Right. And what I've found is that there are no contradictions in scripture. There's lots of misunderstanding. Uh, so there is a seeming contradiction in scripture. But when studying and studying out, you find that there there really aren't contradictions. The word does line up and it's congruent. It's, it stays that way. Um, but yes, in Jasher, there are some blatant contradictions, whether it be an age or the details of a story, um, where demons come from, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's, that's a big one. That's a big mm -hmm. one for me. Yeah, Josh, Glad to the same agree. point, I think that, um, you know, I know you said that it doesn't really pull anybody away and it's, it, I think that that would be true if, if we have that foundational background, if we know our Bible already and we know that we can bounce this up, up against true and meaningful facts and things that we can, you know, go back to Isaiah and have precept upon precept. Now, I just worry about someone coming in and saying, hey, I heard Jasher was some Bible something. They start reading it and that's where they're getting their initial details from. Then they go back to scripture and now they're saying, well, this doesn't line up. Which one do I believe? You know, I think for some of us here on the panel, we, we have such a strong background in scripture and scriptural references where we, that stuff just jumps off the page. We're like, oh, well, this is wrong. That can't be right. This is impossible. There's no way about this. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, here's the issue. So that would be my only concern with that point of it. it may not push somebody the wrong direction. That would be true only if you had that strong background to begin with. If you come into it very wishy-washy or very unknowledgeable, it could actually be a slightly dangerous or even very dangerous mm -hmm. um, to that point. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Josh, does anyone remember if Jasher, um, I'm trying to remember the middle parts of Jasher, does it actually give the Ten Commandments even or the any of the laws that, that the Israelites received at Sinai? I don't think so. It talks about the plagues, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't remember it actually going into that moment like Jubilees and Exodus does where it breaks down all the laws that are given and I don't God, remember doing that either. The angels yeah, speaking the, from heaven. Yeah, those always put a, an importance on the law. With the, with those books, there's always this importance on behavior and things. And I mean, there kind of is in Jasher, but it, yeah, it doesn't specifically reference honoring it. Yeah, chapter 82, it does. Yep, It does? It does it? Yeah. yeah, that's what I was hoping to. Chapter 82 uh, goes over the commandments. That's good. Yeah, it does, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, because I know that like chapter 4 or 5, it's talking about um, one of the guys, one of the patriarchs are teaching his children wisdom and righteousness. Like I think Methuselah um, was teaching wisdom and righteousness to his children and how to upright behavior, how to behave and all things. And, uh, and that's good. That's, that's good. So to me, if I, you yeah, know, verse 24, uh, what are you talking about? 
Sorry, chapter 82. It's verse 24. Okay. 82, 24. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to add to what Josh was saying as far as um, I look at I look at this this little list here and I say number five on the bullet point. Does the writing bear evidence of high moral and spiritual values that reflect the work of the Holy Spirit? This is where it gets sticky, in my opinion, because I, mm -hmm. you know, spoiler alert, I'm not in favor of Jasher, but I do think it has stuff in there that would fit this qualifier. Mm -hmm. It does bear evidence of high moral and spiritual values, except for, <laughs> except for the, like, I have a real problem with, with people rewriting the idea of the resurrection promise. That is like the fundamental promise of covenant Israel. And and placing a, a man in greater, um, placing a man like Enoch in greater esteem in heaven than Christ. Uh, so he would, that means Enoch would have been the first fruits of the first resurrection to be to be going to heaven, to reign over people in heaven. That what does that even mean? Where's Christ during this? Right. Mm -hmm. Because my understanding of Enoch all the way to Revelation, Christ is is in heaven. He comes to earth. He goes back to heaven. So what are we saying? Like, so then it's the father and the son and then Enoch and rain, Enoch's reigning over the angels in heaven. But until Christ comes to the earth is how does this, what does this even look like? And there's no, there's no further explanation of what happens to Enoch. Mm -hmm. okay, so cool. we're just led to believe he's still up there reigning over these angels. Yeah. You know? And so I guess I would have an issue with that because then, it, it does, on one hand, I'm, I'm a little torn on one hand, it seems to fit this qualifier because it does talk about people doing what's right and, and following the commandments of God and trust in the Lord and turning from wickedness. And that's all, that is important. That's good. And I agree with like what Jonathan said, or maybe it was Kyle. If someone doesn't know the rest of the scriptures and they just read this, I would pray that that's what they glean from this book. Mm -hmm. But if they're trying to actually understand the history of how we were made, where we came from, forefathers of the faith, things like that. They're going to get a lot of conflicting details once they get to the other books. And then, and I just, I don't know. I, it, it, it makes me pause, but I, I can't, I can't say that it does not have positive moral and spiritual values in it. It does. So, yeah. So, so like not to conclude anything, cause we right. still got stuff to talk about, but it's like, are we willing to then, take our Sharpies and get rid of the stuff that we think contradicts and keep the stuff that matches these requisites on screen. I personally don't feel comfortable doing it because I think there's just too many contradictions in it. And again, is it, is it in tandem with some of the other books that are morally uplifting and lead people to the commandment keeping and, and covenant keeping and all that? Sure. But like, do we need an, you know, a further elaboration or like a, a book like this to say what's already out there in other books that don't contradict. I don't personally think. Does like I'll be, sense? I'll be honest. Guy, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ken. No, I was going to say, does that make sense? Like I don't, it's just not, a, there's just too many things wrong with it for me to be like, well, you know, chapter 80 though has them on or 82 <laughs> rather has them on Mount Sinai receiving the law and uh, you know, getting the commandments and you know, all that stuff, which is awesome, right? Keeping covenant, blah, blah, blah. Great. But so do other books that don't contradict in any fashion at all. So so when I look at this list right in front of us, um, adding to what we just were saying, I would also struggle, personally, I would struggle with the Song of Solomon that's already been canonized. It, it It's not attributed to any prophet, priest, or apostle. Um, it has not, doesn't have prophecies. It doesn't teach the commandments, doesn't teach the resurrection, doesn't teach the kingdom to come. It's not associated or confirmed by anybody else in scripture. Rabbis in the first century argued about whether to put it in the Jewish canon. Wow. And it does not bear evidence of a high moral spiritual values. It's it's a book about passion between a, a, a beloved and a loved. Like it's, you know, and certain rabbis have called the Song of Solomon um the holy of holies of sexual intimacy mm. of the old testament like it's it's not it's not a book that i would have ever put in a canon and it doesn't fit any of these lists but jewish rabbis they wanted it in the canon yeah so I've i guess I, that's where i struggle because i'm like how far do we take this you know if just because a book like 
you know, the, the book, uh, you know, Gandhi wrote some stuff that has high moral spiritual values. If you, if you took a Sharpie to his writings, you know, right. Or so where do we draw the line? I guess is, is where, is why we're having these conversations. <laughs> That's why I wanted the wisdom of you awesome men to, to join me and Ken and talk about these things together. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, brother. That's good. So uh, do we want to move to the next person? Does everyone have any other things to say what Josh was saying? I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Kyle, are you next or do you want me to go and you go last? How do you want to do this? Yeah, let me go ahead because it might speak to some of the things that's already been said. Okay. And actually, the, the, the statement that you just made or question you just asked. Um, I think it's also important to ask. And this is this is for me. I don't know if you want to include it in the um, um, the lines there, but can this book stand on its own? Right. If you didn't have any other scripture to go on. Right. If, if, if you had one book that you were going to give to someone who was not a believer or someone who wanted to know the word, could you hand them this book and they have an understanding of the kingdom or gospel message? I think that's a very important question that we should that we should ask, um, not to determine necessarily whether it is or is not scripture. But I think any and everything that is God breathed does give us that message. I think we can see it play out in, in all of scripture personally. Um, so in doing so, um, you know, we have things when we look at, when we look at the, the book of Jasher in its entirety, we have things that we know that does line up with scripture. And we have things that are in blatant opposition of it as well. So if we re if we remove those things and we simply just look at what's in the middle, right? What what is that stuff in the middle? That's the additional information, and that additional information is it is it keeping to the same story? Even though it's given us more information, is it keeping to that same line of thought um, or the same overall message, or is it changing it to be something completely different? Um, you know, there's there's all kind of stuff. There's there's some wrong chronology. There's names that are wrong. There's times that are wrong. Lots of other important details that are just simply wrong. Um, and adding details or story details is not a problem. We see that happening in Jubilees, comparing it to Genesis, right? Because I knew Genesis before I knew Jubilees. So when I compare those two, yes, I get a lot more information from Jubilees, but it doesn't take away from any of Genesis, right? It gives additional details. It keeps that same storyline. It gives that kingdom message, all of that. Um, but many of the of the de the added details can change the story itself, change the character of the individuals, uh, and change the overall message. And I find that to be a big problem. One of those things was... Um, already brought up and that was the the deeming demons uh, uh ruling over and being um demons ruling and being ruled over before demons existed um and that ruling over demons that's a very you know gnostic type of thing um chapter seven we had this concept of magic clothing coming into play again right mm -hmm. the gar the garments of adam and eve or, yeah. Um, and then, um, and, and speaking to that that character, um, changing the character of individuals. Uh, one of the one of the real important ones was in chapter forty one. We have Joseph, Joseph uh, portrayed doing some things that um, would be very evil before the Lord, right? Um, in chapter 41, I believe it's 41. Is it 41? Let me make sure. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, 42. 42. Chapter 42, starting with verse 30, uh, reading through uh, part of 41. This is referring to uh, Joseph is crying about his mother being deceased, and he's, he's calling out to her over her grave. Uh, he's praying to her. He's trying to raise her from the dead. All these things, right? Speaking to the dead. 
Um, and then hearing from her from the mm -hmm. grave also. So these are things that does not line up with something that the father says is okay for us to do. This is a big no, no. Sorry, Kyle. Mm -hmm. This is verse 41. You said, mm -hmm. oh. excuse me, uh, chapter 42. Yeah. Verse, verse, uh, verses 30 through part of verse 41. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I don't, unless you guys just want me to read it. I mean, it's, it's a fairly long thing there, but, um, I, th I think that this is a, is one of those big examples that we have of going completely against the character of this individual as we know him in scripture. Hmm. Um, and it goes completely against what the father I mean, we know the story and how Joseph is blessed, right? And how he's brought through all these tribulations and because of his righteousness, because of the man that he is, because of his faith, he is exalted to the positions that he's exalted to, right? And this, this right here changes the entire character of this individual and makes him something that you don't see in, in the other scriptures. Um, so I, th I think... I think things like that is a, is a big deal. So it's that, um, yes, we have stuff that's in here that lines up. We have stuff that's blatantly against, uh, and then you have all the additional stuff in the middle. And that's what we really, really, really have to have to look at with a, with a microscope here, uh, hmm. to be, to be very careful of. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to say, I don't want to come out and say it like this per, uh, specifically, but we know that the enemy likes to twist things, right? It, the, the enemy generally doesn't come out and just tell you a lie that you know is a lie to your face because then you know it's a lie. They take the enemy takes the truth and twists it and makes it a little bit of something else to make your mind go away from the truth. And I see a lot of aspects of that when reading this. So that's that's my two cents. Yeah, it's conjuring the dead, right? Mm -hmm. In a sense, I mean it's. Yeah, I haven't read that. I haven't read this book in a little while. So that um, aspect of what you just talked about was uh, not in my recent memory, but reading over it as you were talking. Yeah, that, that looks like it would be against Yahweh's Torah in a way. Right. And the fact that there was a voice that came back and they're having this exchange. It's uh, yeah. Sketch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good talk, boys. <laughs> awesome, Is that was that all you had your notes you wanted to cover? That's awesome. Yeah, for now, that's that's about it. Absolutely. Great points. I mean, I um, I actually did. I actually overlooked that part about Joseph and his mother. That's that's pretty yeah, amazing. Me too. I was I was reading it as you were saying. I was like, oh yeah 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 yeah. That's <laughs> yeah okay. So I what I glean. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, John. Sorry, sorry, brother. So. Kyle, what I gleaned from you is is major points of, of contention with this book. I didn't hear a lot of positives. Um, I heard that um, that men are ruling over demons. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. And magic clothing of Nimrod procured by Esau. Mm -hmm. I think that's in like chapter the, the mid twenties. And then um, Joseph invoking necromancy, which was in chapter forty two. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, the, 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 the Nimrod clothing reference that I was given was in chapter seven. Oh, it's chapter seven. Okay. Yep. Well, I think, I think Esau takes it in chapter 26 or 25 or something like that. Yeah. Like there's, there's more details to that for sure. Yeah. So that, that definitely kind of harkens back to the whole, uh, golden fleece idea from ancient Greece, mm -hmm. which the Kabbalists love. Um, did we see something like that in the book of Adam and Eve? Ken, do you I don't that? recall that, but the garments of light, the Testament of Job had Job's daughters being given some interesting apparel at the end of the book. If I recall correctly. Yeah. They got the, what we, what I suggested was possibly ZZ's. -Z. They got the, the threads mm -hmm. from heaven that they tied around themselves. Yeah, that caused them to do virtuous and righteous acts or whatever. Can um, I just can I just say that this book 
would makes for an incredible Holly weird movie. <laughs> it sure would. <laughs> you saw what they did with Noah, right? So what I was thinking when Josh was talking about, you know, the, the types of reading it is, and I agree, this is why it's so captivating. When I first started reading it, I was like, wait a minute, man, this is like, I can watch Charlton Heston's 10 commandments or I can watch the Prince of Egypt. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I'm going to go watch the Prince of Egypt. I'm sorry. I, the animation's great. The music's great. Charlton Heston's an old stale man with too much chest hair. Like I, I thought <laughs> that's, that's blasphemy to me, brother. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, Charlton Heston's my man. So I'm just thinking to myself, like, this is how the, the book of Jasher feels to me is like, it's easy to read. It, it's just got some fantastic things in there. Like you get into the battles about the, the sons of Jacob that go and take over these canine cities. And, you know, there's some fantastical things happening with these wars and battles. And um, that's boy. Yeah, I'm sorry. So Kyle, I, that uh, before I start talking about my ideas, I just want to make sure everyone gets a chance to address what you brought up. Yeah, Miss Karen C says Jasher is the Marvel version of Genesis. I think that's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> well said. <laughs> but yeah, Kyle, to your point though, I think that you know when we talk about like the speaking to the dead, and you know, it's funny that we see these themes are very cyclical, right? We've we've had this new movement. It's not exactly new, but I'm going to call it new of grave soaking and all these like kind of weird stuff. And you're like, where does this come from? Where do people even get these ideas? Like I would never in my right mind, go to a graveyard, try to talk to somebody, you know, it just, it just wouldn't enter Jonathan's brain, but yet somewhere, somehow this has became a, a thing to do or something that, you know, like let's follow a model of times past. So we you know we're reading that and we've, you know, we've got some more modern examples. You know, if you do your digging about Lonnie Frisbee and some situations with that, but what's really interesting is that it comes up in the most, interesting crazy off the wall places and you're like well what if they're going back and referring to things like this well if joseph can do it i guess i can do it if it worked for him maybe it'll work for me and he's a man of god he was one of the patriarchs uh sure let's try it you know so i think that's that's again a great point that you bring up for us to just keep a a mindful eye and watch where culture and, and modern religion is going with that and yeah, maybe bethel uh had the book of jasher in their possession when they decided that it was good to go over and do some grave soaking <laughs> who knows maybe so you're right it is it is a weird practice right and it's like um book of enoch chapter six and seven talks about the things the watchers taught mankind all these different types of uh witchcraft and sorcery and different things and and also what was it chapter 69 is uh kazdija talks about he taught mankind the seduction of spirits and so it just makes you wonder what all involved in that is because it, these are like blanket terms. It doesn't give you like their detailed processes of what they were teaching these people. It just gives you like a blanket overview term. And we, we hear, we have, like we, you talked about earlier, um, chapter two and Jasher mentions demons already. And you're like, wait, but have the rebellious angels fallen? Have the Nephilim been, been birthed? Have they died? Have the flood came? Like what, where's the, where's the entire storyline there? That right. uh, I think it was, Jonathan or Kyle earlier made a statement. It's like how many, how many incongruent spots to, to the point where it becomes a different story, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, <laughs> this is the tough part of, of reading books and trying to evaluate what do we think this is here? Because to me, it's like, where did the demons come from? According to the other books, um, which was, which I, I cannot stress this enough. Both the, the Mishnah and modern day Dead Sea scholar um, uh, Rachel Eliard, they they admit that the books like Jubilees, Testament, Twelve Patriarchs, and Enoch that were left out of the Jewish canon in the first century AD, they admit that they were called sacred writings. Mm -hmm. They were already established in the people of Israel who had what they had scrolls in their hand that they thought were inspired scripture. They called them sacred writings. And those are all congruent with each other, those three specifically. They're all congruent with the history of demons. Nephilim, unclean spirits, watchers, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So when we get to another book that tries to broach that time period and it just skips all that information, again, this is where I say it comes up like you know we talked about earlier. Just because the book doesn't mention it doesn't mean that it's it's wrong, but boy, it sure is suspicious that it doesn't mention it. Yeah, you know? it's it's suspicious because it in chapter four, 18, it says during this specific specific time in Genesis six, is 
and their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men. So they don't even like they don't like using sons of God or angels or, you know what I mean, making it blatantly right. obvious that this is a different kind that came down. So they, they use these words that, as we know, they don't really like angels very much. So mm -hmm. they're skipping around that, skirting around that. And they could have mentioned at least, you know, that and created Nephilim and did this. And none of that stuff is mentioned in, in Jasher at all. Like even in the Septuagint translation, just use giants, gigantes. You know, if you don't want to use the word Nephilim or if it gets translated from the Latin, why didn't it use giants? You know, because this apparently this was translated from Latin, which mm -hmm. is one of the points I'll bring up later. It's because there's just a, a specific uh, place in, in one of the many different historical lengthy chapters where it talks about events happening in different places and use a Latin translated word um, that, according to historians, only only came up after way after the events thereof so mm -hmm. there that's what you would call it um an anachronistic error basically meaning like it's a later edition by someone or it's evidence that this was written way after the fact and was not an actual record of the events during the time because from my understanding doesn't this book claim to be the record um i gotta look and i try to remember this real quick let me look at something real quick yeah, I I spotted this little detail that says that the book claims to be written by Jasher, son of Caleb. Right. One right. of Moses' lieutenants. Um, I, but I don't remember reading that in the book of Jasher. Yeah. Um, or at least the one that's supposed to be given by the Talmud. Again, this is why it's tricky because you got to make sure you're reading the right one, not the, not the later one that everyone unanimously agrees was just a fake. Yes, yeah, spurious forgery. Yeah. You got to make sure you're reading the one from the the, the mid the midrashic Talmud. Um, Sean, why don't so you go ahead, me. man? Let's hear your let's hear your points, brother. Hey, yeah, Kyle, Kyle said he had one more thing to address. Real oh, quick. did he? Okay, yeah. If you don't mind, because because somebody in the chat and I forget who it is, so forgive me for not not calling your name. And I know we're not really taking questions from the chat, but they did bring up a, a good point that I think we might need to address when it comes to the um, the issue with Joseph. Um, the the comment was made that this happened before the age of accountability that he was still a child at this point. So what say you guys on that? No, <laughs> no, no, I agree. No. Cause I mean, what, what are we talking about here? Like you're saying that because he was, what is it? Is it the Testament of Gad or Testament of one of the Testaments talk about the age or maybe it was Benjamin, the age of when Joseph was actually sold to the Midianites and then, then sold to the Egyptians. And uh, I, I thought he like was 30 ish, wasn't he? Yeah, I thought he was. Well, I thought he was like 18 or 19. I thought he was definitely an older man. Hmm. Um, but when his mother died, is, did that happen before? Because Benjamin was was the, the cause of his mother dying, right? Hmm. Joseph and Benjamin are brothers, birth from Sarah. Sarah died giving birth to Benjamin. So, regardless, yeah. Joseph, Jacob. Um, I, I, I would struggle with that interpretation because I would, that would lean, that would then lean to, you know, Jacob, what allowing Joseph to try to conjure up Sarah or Rachel, excuse me, yeah. Rachel and her not saying you shouldn't be doing this. Right. You know, even, even a basic, uh, Google search says that he was about 17 at this time. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And we know how correct Google is all the time, you know, sure. But, so, well, and there's just no allowance for that kind of stuff. I don't think there's an age requirement of like, well, if you can do it, if you can hurry up and do it before you're 15 or 16, then it's all good. But anytime after that, now you're sinning. It's like, no, that's just bad. Regardless, sin is sin, evil is evil, you know. And hopefully, we're not accountable for it if it's before the age of, uh, you know, our knowledge. But at the same time, it's still evil, still wrong. Right. And it just yeah. doesn't line. It just doesn't line up with his character, his nature that we see. And throughout yeah. all that, okay, I'm I'm done. The, the testimony <laughs> of Genesis, as well as the testimony of Joseph in in the testament of Benjamin, about how righteous and virtuous he was, especially even a Gad himself. Testament of Gad speaks of how righteous Joseph was his whole life, and how he was uh, without, you know, not not that he was without sin, but that he was without reproach. Like he was he was a good dude. Like he he followed the ways of the Lord all his whole life. Right. Um, so I would just really struggle with that idea and. There's no mention of that in Jubilees um, as far as when when Rachel dies and then 
Jacob then turns his, his full love and affection to Leah and he doesn't try to bring Rachel back or speak to her from the dead. They're just, just where would he get this precedent? I mean, Jacob was a righteous man um, who handed the priesthood down to Levi. Like, I just don't understand where you get this precedent and Jacob favored Joseph. Mm -hmm. So like that doesn't mean that he just spoiled him with the, with the technicolor dream coat like that, you know, like he favored him, meaning he was teaching all his sons to be righteous and therefore, that means he favored Joseph more. So it makes more sense once we see Joseph go out to Egypt on his own, struggling under oppression, slavery, false imprisonment. He maintains righteousness all throughout to the point where God elevates him to this amazing position to save the known world at the time. I just would struggle with him, you know, being a, a necromancer <laughs> part time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just struggle with that idea. I don't know, but that's just my thoughts. OK, thanks, guys. No problem, brother. All right. So I just wanted to basically go into mine real quick because we're going to we're going to we're coming up here in about two hours and I want to give us time to chat a little bit. Um, I, I guess you guys have mentioned a lot of great things already that I, I completely agree with. I just wanted to put down a few of them because I didn't want to go through chapter by chapter. But um, I would say there are some pros. The eternal law of God is suggested, which is similar to Genesis and Jubilees. Um, and this is, I want to go through the pros first because I just want to make let people in the audience know that I'm trying to be as as fair as possible. <laughs> so we do see, like like Josh mentioned earlier, we do see that their sacrifice is being done with Cain Abel. It's consistent in that regard that they're bringing forward at the time of sacrifice, as it mentions in that chapter. I thought that was interesting language. Um, even even if this is a later redaction by um, by people that are you know in Judaism. Um, but they also have Genesis, which conflicts with their ideas of how they teach Exodus and, and the, the law only showing up for the first time in a written manner to, to the people at Mount Sinai. And so this would be a similar type of confliction within Judaism um, that, that Genesis also holds. So it's similar to Genesis in that regard. Um, and the genealogies do align with Genesis. That's that's you know who was born after who, mm -hmm. right? The who beget who, so that does align with Genesis. Um, there are some things in here that I want to be true, but that just you know the the stories of Joseph's son, Jacob's sons, uh, having their own conquest of Canaan, like hundreds of years before Moses and Joshua, um, sounds epic. That's a movie that would be epic, right? We get hints of that in Gen and I think it's Jubilees chapter 37 or 30, 36, maybe. We get hints of that. And that's in the 12 patriarchs, too. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. That they did have to encounter the Canaanites that they lived around and they fought them from time to time. Jasher goes into a lot more detail, um, specifically fighting giants and all kinds of other things. So th there's things in there that we do know there were post flood giants. That's consistent with Numbers 1333 and Deuteron uh, Deuter Deuteronomy 2 and 3. And um, so there's some there's some pros there. There's some consistency. There is some some continuity, if you will, of ideas. Um, but that's pretty much where it stops for me, as far as the the cons get crazy, because like yeah. all the ones that we've already mentioned earlier, uh, some of them you guys kind of stole my thunder on some of these. But not just that the creation of heaven and earth is is really missing because it seems to be very integral to the eschatology, the timepiece of the heavenly clock with the calendars and the feasts of, of God. That seems to be a huge deal in Jubilees and Genesis. Um, that's further referenced and kept throughout all the rest of the, of the law and the prophets. Um, so that's missing. That's conspicuous that it is. Again, I, I said earlier, I'm kind of torn on this because then I go directly to what Ken mentioned earlier, uh, which was a, uh, chapter four, verse 17 and 18, talking about the judges and rulers of men came and took the daughters of men um, and, and had offspring and various, you know, different seemingly like hybrids that were produced from this. Right. So it doesn't even use the same language as Enoch, Jubilees and Genesis to reference this most significant pre-flood point of history, which is why the degradation that, that led to, you know, the statement in Genesis 6, 13, that, 6, 11 through 13, that all the flesh and all the earth was corrupted. Mm -hmm. So it was a there it, that gives that Torah based precedent as well as logical precedent for why that Yahweh would bring the flood. Why the, the severe judgment, right? What, what's the what's the statement that you always hear in debates? You know, extreme claims require extraordinary evidence or something like that. Extraordinary claims. 
So it's like extraordinary judgment requires extraordinary misbehaving. And this is where you don't get that type of thing. I, people worship demons all throughout the Old Testament. God didn't flood them every time they started doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. So for them to just skip right over the entire potentially 700 to 1,000 year time period when the rebellious watchers came in, took wives, had these unclean spirits, babies, Nephilim, offspring, giants, oppressed mankind, led to the degradation of all culture, even the land, and then suddenly you get the flood as a result. It just, it just seems like that's a huge thing to miss, right, to me. Right. Um, another thing that I'd really, really, you know, I agree with the sentiment we've already shared. Ken shared this, the idea of Enoch. Um, not only that he didn't die, but he's reigning in heaven over angels. That, that makes no sense. The only way that makes sense is according to what we do have in the canon already is if he was received his, his resurrection body, then he would have the promise of the covenant so that he could reign over angels. But right now he cannot reign over angels. It, and so that means it's teaching one of two things and both are wrong. I mean, that's teaching that he <laughs> got his resurrection body before Christ. That's a, that's a huge theological error. Or it means that he went to heaven in his fleshly body to reign over them, which is against the promise of the covenant as far as when we do get authority over angels. And that's a major theological error. Um, yep. I would also just bring up the idea that, uh, I mean, little, little stuff like, you know, the death of, of Enoch is mentioned in Jeff chapter five, verse one, but it's, if you line it up as far as when this happened in the 84th year of the life thereof, um, it's actually supposed to say Enosh, um, and it's not Enoch. Um, it says that Moses was 18 years old when he fled Egypt instead of Acts chapter seven saying he was 40 years old when he fled Egypt. Jubilees is consistent with the account that Stephen records in the book of Acts chapter seven, because Jubilees talks about how he grew up for 21 years being, being fathered by sired by his own mother and father and taught uh, the ways of his own mother and father, which would have been the, the, the priesthood as he was a Levite. And then he went into learn all the, all the wisdom of Egypt and went into the courts of Pharaoh because technically his legal mother was one of the daughters of, of Pharaoh. So, that's a, that's a major discrepancy there because then all that time that he's supposed to be learning the wisdom of Egypt, the book of Jasher has him off in Cush reigning over other people and taking wives and becoming a hero of down there. So again, historically we got a problem with there's no accounts in ancient Cush with Moses reigning over the people and they, they have no problem hanging on to the accounts of other people in the Bible mentioned that interact with their culture that they still glorify and talk about all the time in modern day Ethiopia, but they'd have no mention of, of Moses ever reigning over their ancient ancestors throughout whatever kingdom you want to look at in ancient Egypt. It's very sus suspect that this is a missing account. Um, and also another thing, this is my last point as far as something I think is a con against Jasher. Canaan doesn't line up. So this, this famous passage here in Genesis chapter 10 in the Septuagint, where in the genealogy of our facts that Canaan is missing in the Masoretic it's included in the Septuagint. The Septuagint's translation is validated by Luke chapter 3's genealogy. But Jasher and the Masoretic, both favored by rabbinic Judaism, are missing this particular guy. This particular guy was the one that Jubilees chapter 8, verses 1 through 8, says was responsible for finding the teachings of the watchers, the thing that Jasher was mentioning, that the thing that Jasher misses, all that information. Um, and he brought that those teachings back out into the forefront during the days of Nebrod, Nimrod, um, mm -hmm. in in that era after the flood, a couple hundred years after the flood. So, just way too suspicious, guys. Way too suspicious for me to to think the theological errors, the continuity errors. The um, look, there's anachronistic issues with lots of different books, and that's fine because different scribes have had them over different times. But theological errors are so large. That I can I could I can overlook you know some people dying in different deaths and things like that because there is discrepancies with translations over time, but some of the theological stuff that it teaches and, and the implications it this, the domino effect that it has like I just laid out with Canaan's genealogy, the Watchers missing, that's a huge problem for me. So I would put my vote to to throw in that Jasher should should be burned in the fire. <laughs> Okay. Book, book burning style. Are we Sean? We're there already. <laughs> Jasher, Jasher gets gets thrown to the back of the bookstore <laughs> nonchalantly. 
<laughs> back to the 99 cent bin. It'd still make a good movie. Yeah. Can we at well, least rip out the Nimrod parts? And keep those, maybe? <laughs> that was one of the things that appealed to me so much in uh, in that book was just Nimrod, right? He's a he's an arch nemesis. Like he's one of the he's coming back, guys. Apparently, mm. and I I haven't read much literature that expounds upon him and his rule and reign uh, in Shinar and just all that stuff. So to me, that was super intriguing. Um, yeah. But again, no, everything that Sean said and the rest of you brothers have said, I, I 100% agree, and it doesn't matter. I'd like to pose a question. If we, and this kind of goes back to my line of thought earlier, and thinking about this myself, I couldn't come up with an answer, so I'd be curious if you guys could. If we remove all of the things um, that pretty much line up word for word, right, it, in other scriptures, if we re remove <laughs> those things or just set them to the side, and then we remove the things that are obvious problems. What are we left with that we can glean from that is going to be good for instruction and reproof and all that? Can you guys think of anything specifically that stands out to you that, that would do that? No, it, it does directly list uh, the commandments. Like, like we, you guys help me remember, right? I didn't, I haven't no. reread the seventies and eighties chapters in, a, in quite some time. Mm -hmm. So they weren't fresh in my mind. So yeah, if it's got the actual commandments listed in it, that's, that's good. Um, well, yeah, but that would be the same stuff, right? So, so something that would maybe be I misunderstood the question. I'm sorry. Yeah. If you, if you take the things that are the same as what we have in other scriptures, right? Kind mm -hmm. of a word for word type thing. If we take those and we set those to the side. So command commandments, that's awesome. That's great. Mm -hmm. Love that it's in there. Uh, but if we just set that to the side, put it on the shelf, because we do have that in other scriptures. I guess what I'm looking for is what is the benefit of the book? The benefit of the book is the additional information that we find, right? So if we remove of that additional information, if we remove the things that are obvious problems, what are we left with that we can glean from that would be beneficial? Esau killing Nimrod. <laughs> No, I hear. I understand what you're saying. I get the. I get. I get that, and probably not much. Honestly, you just get some cooler added details that uh, <laughs> aren't really in the in the long term going to matter in terms of salvation or in terms of understanding the overall message of the gospel of the kingdom of God. So I, I get what you're saying, Kyle. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Good visuals. Good visuals, and even the mindset it gives you of the people building the Tower of Babel. It just seems like that would have been their mindsets. You have three different categories of people, you know, kind of like you had three different races of giants in Enoch, like people that want to rule over and, you know, actually take out the most high. And then you have people that want to be like the most high. Like you just have all these different. And it's kind of like people today. They kind of have that like people that want to they want to be their own God. They want to be they want all these powers and worldly things. And so I don't know. in some ways it helps you relate to the powers of darkness today that we have. Powers mm -hmm. it shouldn't be. Yeah, for sure, brother. It won't be for long. Yeah, and there and there are a bunch of other ones that contradict. Um, but for time's sake, we don't need to go through all of them. But yeah. um, yeah. So my my as a council member here, a council, nice to see you. I'm giving it a thumbs down. I assume Sean <laughs> Sean wants to burn the books, so I'm. I'm gonna get it. <laughs> And you guys got sound a like you're bow and arrow in the garage. I'm gonna use for tiger practice in the book of Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I honestly, I you know, I try to be joking and, and you know, funny about it, but like I read, I remember reading the book of Jackson like 2012 was the first time I read it, and I, I was fascinated again. Like the points I drew out though, um, the reason why over time it started to really be unsettled with me is the more I studied the, the, the promise of the resurrection. And the details that involves Yeshua, and then I started to see the the importance that 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 the Book of Jasher then, as a result, would place on Enoch, and therefore it would lend to Kabbalistic Judaism and not Christian the Christian faith in Christ. And so, to me, that was that became a huge red flag for me. Yeah, yeah. And we 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 we've seen people in the modern day. Um, come up against a discrepancy between Jubilees and Jasher and they've chosen Jasher for certain reasons. And I, I don't get to have conversations with every single one of the people that, that disagrees with the book of Jubilees. Um, but 
there is to me, it's like the more that we study, the more that we study the, the canon that we do have, the 66 that we do have still. And I would even suggest the the 14 that we used to have in the United the, the American canon that we that uh, you can that are called the apocrypha, but they're just as inspired as, as all the other ones. I would say if we studied those 80 books, uh, you get to a book like Jubilees and you start to really see how everything is is synchronized and lines up theologically. And so um that's that's where I would struggle because then it becomes an a and and you guys can let me know how you feel about this, but then it becomes an appeal con to consensus of like, well, the majority of witnesses all agree with this theology and here's Jasher standing alone. So then I got a problem mm -hmm. with that. You know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. well, the majority of witnesses all say that Christ is the first resurrection and that the resurrection happens at a specific time and that no one can ascend into heaven until then, until you get your resurrection body. And then here's Jasher over here saying Enoch did it, which also goes into third Enoch which we've never attested as, as inspired scripture since we started on our Kings. And we haven't even officially reviewed that book, <laughs> but that one is the one that directly talks about Enoch becoming Metatron mm -hmm. going to heaven and become a Metatron. Mm -hmm. So like, this is, it's Kabbalism. Like it's not, it's not uh, scripture in my opinion. So yeah, it'd be great to get some, uh, some of these other folks who are promoting the book, Jasher, that is um, mm -hmm. on such a thing, right? To, just, so it's not an echo chamber because we all have a thumbs down on this for right reasons. But I want to hear what others have to say. I agree. After we have these types of conversations, like are they have they considered anything that we talk about or are they just kind of like in love with whatever aspects of the book too much to discredit what we're saying? Maybe we can have a, a revisit of the book in the future. And when their schedules do align, they were invited, but maybe their schedules just didn't align, align today. So got to respect yeah. that. So, so, Sean, yeah. are you saying there's not going to be a contextual study guide for Jasher? <laughs> <laughs> no, we already list, we already um, uh, published our list of books that we're going to put in it. It's on our on our Patreon, and we put it in our, our Facebook Kingdom Crew group back in the day. Um, so, Jasher Jasher did not make the cut a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, Jr. Cleve saying, "Do we really need to do Third Enoch?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We just give it all oh, the fun right now, just for time's sake. <laughs> yeah, well, like if we do, if we do, my goal and what I talked to Ken about with this whole new format idea for Honor Kings was that we just do one a month. That gives everybody plenty of time to, if you want to attend, you're not required to attend. Like there may be some dates, some uh, some times where Ken's not here and I am, and vice versa, right? And then because of our schedules, but we do one a month. Uh, we have a rotating group of, of other council guests, you know, that come in and, and talk about these books with us. And maybe, maybe one month we tackle three in one setting because they're really small, like 30, mm -hmm. not, you know, or like the Genesis Apocryphon or like, uh, you know, just different, you know, the different books that are small. That'd be cool. Yeah. Very cool. And we can incentivize it, Sean, like, uh, for those who want to come to the council, they can get the background if they come. Yeah. That's um, right. And get then the... subsequent councils, they can get the, <laughs> the robe, the garb will start wearing. Right. <laughs> we need that. We need that. I can't wait. Photoshop some, some old monk dudes in the background and robes. Right. Doing their little hand signals that they do and all the creed pictures. It's yeah. <laughs> funny. I think uh, Ken and I talked about, we did want to talk. Uh, we wanted to touch on the Testament of Abraham, I believe at some point this year. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanted to do one of the Maccabees. Uh, personally um but yeah we can all suggest books that you might want to look at as well and that you think need to be looked at and tested and and we can revisit other books that we that we've already not, we haven't finished in the past i guess like first enoch's a massive book we haven't finished we were going chapter by chapter through that but that's a massive book so we haven't finished it yeah and like second ezra second baruch we've only touched certain chapters and in yeah. those books and they're huge and so much content to talk about in them but maybe we can do a whole show on the song of solomon and really step on everybody's toes <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can have a um now well and yeah, anyway so yeah i you know that's all i had guys personally that's was you know I, I appreciate you guys being patient with me with this new format and um trying to feel out the flow and everything because we didn't really have a practice for this <laughs> no, so yeah. i like it and we'll take suggestions from folks too if they want to see things done a certain way. If there's a bit more of a uh, 
a structure that they would appreciate us following. Uh, I'm I'm willing to, you know, constructive criticism is great. So, yeah, because it's 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 about a lot of people like our audience members. You're not just audience, right? You you guys are part of this greater community too, right? You you're well studied. You know the you know the narrative. You know the message. So yeah, we want to hear. If you're not necessarily on the video with us doing the actual live discussions, that's fine. But let's hear what you have to say too. Yeah, there's some great guys and gals that uh, we get to uh, fellowship with on on Discord. That's a lot of fun. Um, goodness, we were I was up till almost eight this morning on Discord chatting with everybody. And uh, <laughs> it's a drug, brother. It is. It is. And uh, we have a lot of fun. So um, uh, yeah, by all means, guys, please please let us know your thoughts on this stuff because with different perspective. An insight, you know, can or can give us a, a better insight. So that would be yeah. that would be wonderful. Gospel and Nicodemus for sure is one I'm seeing here in the chat. They want that one. Uh, I'd Plus like to Barnabas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, guys, I just put this is you know some basic stuff I, I kind of pinned down as we were talking. Uh, just a general overview: Book of Jasher, Sefer HaYasher in Hebrew means Book of the Upright or the Upright or Correct Record. Um, I, I definitely disagree with that as far as the title. Um, it says there's another yeah. book out there that many people confuse with the book of Jasher, uh, printed in around the 1750s, uh, by a gentleman whom it's so funny. If you look into his history, England was like super mad at him from printing stuff that they disagreed with. And so they imprisoned him at one point for, for publishing something against somebody else, basically. Which is pretty wild. Um, the text they made him. They made him do community service in three years. <laughs> <laughs> it's wild. Yeah. What rebel? They're like because they didn't have you know freedom of the press, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's not the United States. So the this text, the one that's from the ancient Hebrew text of from the the Talmudic sources, it covers much the same ground as the general mosaic books of the Bible, but from the creation of the world, the death of Moses, albeit with several minor variations. So that's a pretty pretty accurate um, description overall. Pros that we looked at today, you guys can let me know if you want me to change these or add or take away. Draws further further positive attention to inspired books already accepted. It mentions the two magicians, Janus and Jambres, that imposed Moses and lines with 2 Timothy 2.3. The eternal law of God suggested some with Genesis and genealogies align with Genesis. Do you guys think of another one that you want to put on here? That's good. I don't think it matters at this point. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. the scale is still heavily weighing to one yeah. side for yeah. me. And I, I won't reiterate these, um, but we we talked about these in great depth, but these are all the cons that we reviewed uh, today. And let me go down here. To the hey, Sean, one. real quick. The, the pros, that was 2 Timothy 3.8, just to update. I think you had 2.3. Oh, okay, my bad. That's right. So, and then the historical stuff was uh, as much as we can understand that this particular version from the from the Talmudic sources printed in the 1600s, but we don't know exactly when it was written. Uh, it's not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It has Masoretic references not found in the Septuagint, which might give you an indication since on when it was written or, or penned, since the Masoretic was almost a thousand years after the first Septuagint, and so. And early church fathers' claims against Judaism's redactions of Scripture show a weight against books like this that we can't see ancient manuscripts for whom align more with the Masoretic because that was why there's such big differences between the, the Greek translations from the Septuagint versus the Masoretic that came out in approximately the 8th century AD. So this is, Ken and I have talked about this on our Kings last year when we reviewed the book of Job. So... All right, guys. All right. We'll, we'll work on this. We'll work on the production, the background, yeah. and everything. This is just like a spontaneous idea here, but uh, I thought it would be great yeah. that we do this. Um, I shouldn't say that it wasn't spontaneous. I talked about to Ken about this like months ago, but this was a uh, you got having you guys on was kind of spontaneous to you. So hmm. now that people kind of see our attempt at the format and the ideas that we want to try to present and, and give some sort of co coherency to how we're evaluating these things, um, hopefully we can. We'll have just as much fun next month when we do a different a different talk. 
Yeah, exactly. And I appreciate you guys coming on. Thank you for your boldness and willingness to come and join us. And you guys over at Anchor the Truth, keep doing your thing. Keep Man, promoting yeah, those awesome us. books, Jubilees. You know, Absolutely. it's Thanks awesome. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's been a blessing. It, 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 is, it does take boldness. I agree, Ken, because like we get so much hate, man, when we say a oh, book yeah. is not a book. Like people yeah. people start writing, they start typing. Yep. <laughs> so all right. Anything any last words, guys? I'm gonna get ready for Days of Noah premiere. All right. That's where I'm going right now. My wife's honking in the car waiting on me to go watch it. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, nice I, to see I, you. Nice I have a watch party. Party. <laughs> Join me at my watch party on my channel. I'm gonna be watching the days of Noah live. So hey, there you you go. Go. I'll go watch it, family. It's gonna be fun. There you go. Awesome guys. We'll see y'all next time on Honor of Kings. Yep.